Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting of Tuesday, June 25th, 2013. I will call the meeting to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of our May 28th meeting. Any comments around the minutes? Barry, any comments on the, on the minutes from last week? Or last month, rather? Yeah, that's right. You're good to go? Okay. We got a motion for the approval of the minutes. I move we approve the minutes of the May 28th, 2013 meeting as drafted. Okay. Seconded. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. 5 0. Okay. Uh, first item, it's all new business. Um, this is to hear the request of Heather Dallas of One Indian Rock Woods, Scarborough, Maine, for an administrative appeal of a letter written by the CEO concerning Map 7, Lot 46A. Um, I know we've gotten a lot of uh, correspondence on this particular application. Uh, what I'd like to do is we will hear the um, uh, the appeal motion of the uh, applicant. Uh, the board will ask whatever questions they may have of of the applicant. We'll then uh, listen to the um, any uh, public. Com we'll put the public comment of the other uh, within the context of the other. Uh, letters that we've seen as well and the board will ask questions of those so we're going to try and avoid the freewheeling discussion that sometimes we get into in, in some of our meetings so um, before we uh, get into the um, the presentation um, Ben would you like to just give us some background on this appeal sure uh, this is a 4,000 square foot lot at 502 Delano Park uh, there, there's been a garage. It's a non-conforming lot, obviously. There's a non-conforming structure. There's a garage has been on the lot for 40, 50, 60 years, maybe, since before we kept records. Uh, in the mid-90s, the then owner of the property began a process to use the garage as a dwelling unit. The May 17, 1994 assessment record characterizes the upstairs as garage quarters or, or characterize the structure as garage quarters not usable no disposal system no plumbing and not used those are notes from the assessor May 17th 1994 since then uh, the only permit or approval that the town has issued is for the septic system there, there was never a certificate of occupancy, no internal plumbing permits, no electrical permits, no building permits, and uh, it, and, and that's the situation. So it, it's it's a very murky file to determine the legal use on the property. Uh, there's also correspondence uh, between the for, former CEO Bruce Smith. Also, there's correspondence with the CEO prior, Ernie McVeigh, uh, between the owners of the property. And uh, I was asked to sort this out and write a document that I believe amounts to the legal use of the property, and, and that's the letter that is being appealed. Do you have any photographs? Yeah, I wanted to ask, Ben, if you could describe the current condition of the property. Is it still just kind of an apartment with a, you know, a garage with a toilet in it that goes to the septic, or is it an actual residence now? I don't know. Um, and there was... The, let's, let's hold off on that until... No, I... I don't know. I, I do not know the interior condition. I, I don't know if plumbing was in there. 
I, I don't know how plumbing would have gotten in there without any plumbing permits being issued. Okay, that was going to be my question. So, so the town doesn't have any record of any permits being issued for the installation of any plumbing whatsoever? Correct. Okay, so as far as the town is concerned, absent um, Mr. Smith's, uh, the correspondence, from the town's perspective, it remains what it says on the, on the assessor records from 1997? The, the assessment record did change in 2011 that indicated it was used as living space, but the, the assessor did not inspect it. He, the, he, the, the current assessor, who's been here for 15 or so years, has also never stepped foot in there and doesn't know what's in there. He, uh, he has a significant level of depreciation on it, mm -hmm. but uh, he, he said he based his 2011 assessment of living space on the code enforcement officers, on, on knowledge from the code enforcement officer that it was now a dwelling unit. Okay. And we don't have a copy of your letter in, in this particular application, right? Or do we? And I've just blown through it. What's the system? I think it was in that blue packet that we got. Before the last meeting, got the blue packet. Right, okay. Yes, okay. Okay. No assessment. Okay. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, good evening. I'm Tom Jewell. Uh, sounds quite loud here. <laughs> uh, attorney for the applicants. I mean, my partner, uh, Paul Bulger, wrote the brief. I were with the firm of Jewell and Bulger from Portland. If I may, I have some recent pictures of the property, if I can pass those out. Sure. Uh, just one point of order. I, I asked uh, Mr. Bulger, since he had written the brief, uh, he was sort of the, the attorney who was getting correspondence. I had asked him if, if he had ever seen a brief from Attorney Bischoff, which we had expected because we knew he had entered his appearance and requested a continuance from the hearing that uh, was scheduled before. And we never received that. I didn't know he had filed a brief until this evening when uh, Ben indicated that he had received one. So. I haven't really had a chance to read that or prepare any rebuttal. If there's anything kind of new and unusual in that brief uh, that would prejudice, uh, I would like the opportunity to uh, come back at a subsequent hearing and once we've had an opportunity to prepare a proper response to that. Uh, but perhaps we won't need to do that. I'll see how it goes. <laughs> That's my hope. Um, so I'm here with uh, my clients, the owners, uh, Heather Dallas and her husband, Howard Levy. They've owned the property since 2004. Um, Bruce Smith is also here. We, they had asked him if he could appear in case there were some questions that um, he might be able to assist with regarding the history of the property. Uh, I know from the many hours my clients have spent dealing with this property and its history, they've never been able to find anything prior to 1996. Uh, that shows anything of the property, even though, as Ben said, it's probably been there 40 or more years prior to that. So, I mean, they suspect uh, that there are some missing documents, perhaps a, an older file that had gotten lost that dealt with some of these issues. But, um, you know, at this juncture, there's no history in this property that they've been able to find prior to 1996. Uh, this property and Lot 44 were owned together for many years uh, until the last uh, month or two when, the, when Lot 44 was sold separately. Um, I, you'll have to excuse me if I 
mispronounced Delano, I work with a loan officer, Delano, whose name is exactly the same, and that's, I kept calling this Delano until uh, somebody corrected me. Um, when they bought these properties uh, at Delano Park, uh, the small lot had a septic tank on it, and there was a pipe in the road that connected it to the main property, lot 44, where the leach field uh, was that served both of these properties. And that was apparently installed by Lisa Newbold in the mid, mid or late 90s. And at that time, Ernie McVeigh had issued the permit, and he had found that lot 46 at that time was a grandfathered residential use and allowed um, the, the installation of the septic system. But at that time, discussed with Lisa that, that because the, there was a pipe joining the two properties that shared a common leach field that they would have to stay in common ownership. Um, now later, that when my clients bought the property, their attorney pointed out that the pipe that had been put in the, the private road at Delano Park, uh, that there was no easement for that. Uh, so they approached the Delano Park Association to request a formal easement, and I think Mr. McLaughlin just gave you uh, a letter from the association essentially denying that request in 2006. So look, our, my clients decided to look at other options. And they had found that the, um, that the science of septic disposal had advanced enough that it was possible to put a sep separate leach field on lot 46 just to serve that property. So they began an effort in the mid-2000s to do that. Um, Bruce Smith was involved. Bruce at the time had issued his letter that we had submitted in 2005 indicating that this was a grandfathered single family dwelling. And he later issued uh, septic uh, permits to allow the separate leach field to serve lot 46A as a separate uh, single family dwelling. So besides the written um, findings of Mr. Smith over those years. Um, my clients, particularly Heather, had many meetings with, with Mr. Smith. Uh, each one of them, he confirmed that this was a grandfathered single family dwelling that could be sold separately. And based on that, they installed the, the leach field for lot 46A and eventually sold the main house, which happened recently. Uh, so the septic system was, was certainly a, a decision in and of itself of the code enforcement office and, and similar to a building permit. And those permits that were issued, again, in the late around uh, 2007 have never been appealed. And the work has been done to install those leach fields. Uh, no further issues arose until this year when my clients began an effort to sell the main house separately and look at an option to improve the existing dwelling, that, which is admittedly pretty ugly. Uh, so we've submitted pictures of the present building and attached to that are some sketches that uh, their architect uh, has prepared to show a possible replacement for the existing structure. Uh, that would involve tearing down the existing structure and putting up this new building. The architect as well had many meetings with Mr. Smith to discuss what could occur on the property. And again, in those meetings, Mr. Smith reiterated that this was a single family dwelling and could be torn down and replaced with a new structure. Uh, that brought some angst to the neighbors who brought their concerns to Mr. McDougall. And based on that, he issued his letter of March 29, 2013, which is the, the subject of this evening's appeal. Now, I'd like to emphasize that Mr. McDougall first finds that there is a grandfathered single-family dwelling unit at this property. However, then he goes on to opine that it is an accessory dwelling unit, uh, which is a non-conforming use in the RA zone. Now, Mr. McDougall's letter makes it clear that his conclusion was based upon representations that the prior owners had apparently made to Ernie McVeigh. Um, that the main lot and the small lot would stay together. And that's where he came up, apparently, with a conclusion that, that the small lot was an accessory dwelling unit. 
because he does allude to the earlier correspondence between Mr. McVean and Mrs. Newbold that the two lots would, would stay in, the, in common ownership, which again was revised once the new lease field went in and Mr. Smith looked at it and found there was no need to keep them connected um, because they each were separate independent living quarters at that time. That agreement between Mrs. Newbold and, and Ernie McVeigh was never reduced to any kind of formal easement or covenant that was recorded with the property. So there's nothing other than a discussion between those two that suggests that, that there was any agreement. And certainly a discussion of that sort is not binding on subsequent property owners. Now looking, uh, so we're really here just to, for the very limited purpose of appealing Mr. McDougall's finding that this is an accessory dwelling unit as opposed to simply a single family dwelling unit as had been found by earlier code enforcement officers. If, if the board would simply uh, well, turn to the definition of accessory dwelling unit uh, under section 19-1-3, which we have set forth in our, in our submission, it's quite short, so I'll read it in full. Uh, accessory dwelling unit, uh, a single subordinate dwelling unit, accessory to and wholly contained within a principal building or structure and or attached garage in which a single family dwelling unit is the principal use. So th there's no conceivable way that lot 46A could be defined as an accessory dwelling unit. It's not attached to the main building, uh, never has been, it's always been a separate lot. There's other lots, at least one of the lot with separate ownership between the two. There's never been a merger and Again, I would respectfully submit, Mr. McDougall, that uh, describing this as an accessory dwelling unit is, um, is not a, a proper interpretation of, of the ordinance. And again, uh, so as I mentioned, Mr. McDougall had, had found uh, as a premise for his opinion that there was a grandfather dwelling unit on the property. That issue has never been appealed. The abutters have not filed any appeal arguing that that is incorrect. So at at this juncture, the ZBA, of course, being a board of limited jurisdiction, can only review appeals that are presented to it. At this juncture, the only appeal pending is the appeal that the applicants have filed, and on that appeal, our only issue is with the addition of the word accessory to the dwelling unit that Mr. McDougall put in his letter. So I would suggest that efforts to go back to the earlier history of the property, which is, the board has already uh, started to discuss, is not appropriate. There's nothing before the board this evening that opens the door for a discussion of that. We're only here to review our appeal, and that's on the very narrow issue of whether this is an accessory dwelling unit or a single family dwelling unit. If the abiders had a problem with this being a dwelling unit, they could have filed their own appeal. It's been two and a half months, they've never done that. So if it, of course, as Mr. McDougall properly points out, an accessory dwelling unit is not a conforming use under the ordinance. On the other hand, a single family dwelling unit is a conforming use in the RA zone under section 19-6-1B2A. So it is a, the property here is a conforming use on a non-conforming lot. So if the board agrees with my contention that the only issue here is the very limited one for discussion, then the issues that we submit in our brief, the items one and three, would never be reached, although I would like to reserve the right to go back to those if, if my contention doesn't uh, hold up with the board. So in conclusion, um, keeping it short and sweet, because again, we're only here on that one little issue, we submit that Lot 46A has been, been determined mul multiple times by three code enforcement officers to have a grandfather dwelling unit. It clearly isn't an accessory dwelling unit, so it must be just simply a single family dwelling unit. Uh, that's the only issue for the board to consider tonight uh, is uh, that status and our appeal, uh, limited appeal, Mr. McDougall's letter to that effect. And that is it for my 
my presentation at this juncture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should mention that both Heather, in particular, and Howard have spent many hours analyzing all this. They probably know the ordinance better than I do, and are likely to jump in at any time. I, is there anything that you folks would like to add at this juncture, or anything I've misstated? I, if you do, we'd like you to go to the microphone. Given that if we're only going to address that specific issue, then this may not be relevant, but just to answer the question or to uh, correct a couple facts about the living unit or when it had, when it had living unit. And Tom, you want to look at this with me or no? I have a copy of a card that has a 1993 date on it and a 2002 date on it that shows that calls it a seasonal dwelling, single family seasonal. It has an upstairs with a wood floor, some softwood, some hardwood, drywall, electric. So just for the sake of answering your earlier questions or whatever. So I don't know if you want to see this or not, but anyway, I have it. So just to that point, you live there, obviously. That's no, where don't live there. you don't live there. No. Is it in? No. Is it currently in a condition such that people live? Yeah, it's been it's there? been lived in since before we bought the property. Mm -hmm. There's been tenants in there. If, if you have tenants. a 1992 uh, card or anything else of that sort that you want in the record, uh, you need to give us copies of it in order for it to come into okay. the record. Okay. So if you want it in, I'm not. If we stick on point, then it's not relevant. But since you were inquiring, I thought I'd. Answer it. Thank you. I have one initial question. So um, you mentioned that you had not yet seen the brief from uh, Mr. Bischoff, but just uh, to touch on one point that he raises, and I think it, it's easy to dispose with, but we have to touch on it anyways because it's a jurisdictional issue. Uh, he raises the argument that the appeal is not timely by virtue of the fact that you filed 31 days after by virtue of the fact that it felt the 30 days fell on a Sunday? That's correct. The 30 days fell on a weekend, so we did file it on the next business day, which I, I have to admit is, is um, certainly applies to rules of court. I, I don't know specifically about if Cape Elizabeth has a different rule in that regard. I do note that there was no authority uh, mentioned in the brief uh, that suggested that that was fatal mm. to an appeal. And, and if that, again, that's an example that if that does become a problem, uh, then we would certainly like an opportunity to brief that point. So I, I know in talking with Ben earlier, uh, that, uh, he, in fact, we had talked with him um, prior to that Friday when we were late in getting our brief together, and I think he said it would be okay to file it on Monday, not that that in and of itself would, would change any applicable deadline. So uh, I, it may come up when uh, the other side has an opportunity to present uh, their arguments uh, as to whether that extension applies. And I, I completely understand that normally if something falls on a Sunday, you get to uh, the next day, much like uh, tax holiday, the tax days and everything else will move if they fall on Patriot's Day, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, just a correction. I, I do, I also believe that if something falls on a holiday or a weekend, you get the next business day, but I did not say on Friday that you have till Monday. Oh, okay. I, uh, I never said that. was that. Paul talking with you. I, I wasn't directly involved with that conversation. I know we had some conversations about trying to get it in that Friday, and, yeah. and that didn't happen. So. Correct. Um, are you familiar with what the minimum lot size is in the RA district? Yes, way less than what we have here. More. Way less? More. Way, oh, I'm sorry. I misspoke. Yes, I know it's, we have a small lot in the zone. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we certainly have a non-conforming lot. Mm -hmm. okay. When was lot 46 sold? The, the larger... Lot 44? Oh, sorry. Uh, a couple of months ago? One month ago? Uh, April 15th. So after the CEO had already issued his letter? Correct. So uh, but I would... If I may add one thing, I mean, it was under contract prior to that letter coming out. And again, at the time it was put under contract, there'd been many conversations with Mr. Smith over the years that this was a separate law and could be 
uh, sold separately. So when it went under contract, Mr. McDougall had not yet written his letter, and, it, and my clients were subject to a binding contract that they would have had to breach. If and I, I understand the argument that your clients may not um, are arguing that they were, may have been unaware at the time of purchase of any agreement that may have existed between the prior owner and the CEO regarding um, the, the inability to split the lots if the septic system was in, uh, approved. Were they aware of it at the time of the sale in April? Yes, but again, in the intervening years... I understand, there, I understand. I just a lot had happened. get all the facts right. out. Uh, they believe that later on it was indicated that there was approval to split the lots. <laughs> Nevertheless, they were aware of the prior agreement at the time of the sale. Right. Their attorney, I believe, gave them an opinion that because that had never been reduced to a formal easement or covenant, that it was not binding. So under that argument, we often will grant variances or uh, conditional use permits for businesses. Would, are you telling us that if we don't require the individuals to register that with the Registry of Deeds, that uh, the restrictions we place on them are not enforceable? Well, I guess no less than subsequent conversations with Mr. Smith that suggested it wasn't a covenant that was, that was necessary and it could be sold separately. So I, you know, if, if Mr. McVeigh's opinion was binding, then I suppose Mr. Smith's subsequent change of opinion would be binding as well. I guess I'm curious to hear more about what conversations you're saying that Mr. Smith had with your clients because it seems like from what I've read, Mr. Smith spoke to the prior owners. Your clients bought the property in 2000, August of 2004. Correct. I know your clients, from what I've seen in the record, or at least what's been submitted, they were speaking to the association, but I'm not sure I've seen anything talking about them talking to former code enforcement officers. I mean, I'm just, I'd like to know when they spoke to him and what. Well, they, they actually were able to obtain his calendar that shows, I think, at least eight formal meetings that you had with Mr. Smith over the years. I don't know, maybe Mr. Smith would like to speak to that if, if you want to inquire on that point. Corey, we'd, we could submit the Mr. Smith's calendar into evidence if you would like to, to pursue that issue. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I'm at, I mean you're, you're telling me that they've spoken to Mr. Smith. I'm, I'm telling you, I haven't seen anything, heard anything about it. I just want to know well, they, what yeah, they're I mean, about. I mean, I, well, again, other than Mr. Smith's letter of 2005 and various uh, septic systems, there was really nothing in writing between them regarding uh, those conversations. So again, he did issue those written opinions and decisions indicating that, that he considered this a single family lot. And those were borne out by many meetings where he said the same thing verbally that wasn't reduced to writing. I'm not sure I'm getting quite to your point. You mean, you say you, you've, made, you've made a sale. I'm sorry? You, you've made a sale of this particular piece of property? Uh, the main lot, lot 44, was sold in, on April 15th. The lot that we're talking about uh, tonight. They, they, that's still owned by the applicants, lot 46A. Help me out on that again. What we're talking about tonight, has that been sold? No. Oh, okay, the other one, okay. Right. Is, is there currently a septic system on 46A? Yes, and Leachfield. Okay, so there, the pipe that go, runs across the road no longer is used by this lot? Correct. When the association refused to grant a formal easement, the clients looked at other options and decided to, that they could actually install a, a system on 46A to serve that property. And it was installed and it's there and it's for a one bedroom, two bedroom? I think it's two. Do I need to repeat that nope. for the record? Will that, uh, one to two family, uh, one, single family dwelling, one to two bedrooms. Septic is installed on the property. And uh, just so we're clear, Exhibit G, uh, which is the letter from uh, CEO Smith dated November 25th, 2005, indicates that seven, eight days after he started as uh, the CEO for the town, 
uh, quote, I approve the septic, septic system application on 923.97, but with a restriction that the two properties remain in the same ownership. So as of 2005, his position was still that it was approved with the restriction that the properties remain in the same ownership. Right. Again, up to that point, they shared a common leach field. So it wasn't until the proposal came forward to install a new leach field on lot 46A that the conversation turned to the fact that this was a separate single family dwelling. That was Exhibit G, Chris? Uh, exhibit G, yes. So, uh, but I understand the argument that it's a separate single family dwelling, was, but was the explicit statement ever made by the CEO that, and therefore, that prior restriction I placed in permitting the septic system no longer applies? Again, not, I don't believe in writing that was done, but I, Was it said verbally? I, but yes, many times. Again, the, Mr. Smith met with the architect. They knew the plans for the property. That was the whole idea of installing a separate leach field was to, uh, is to p prepare the property for potential separate sale. So that was the, the plan from when you first started. Well, do you want to come up? Why don't you come up here and... <laughs> Right, yes. I want to be correcting you if I don't have to. No, well, All right. correct away. Um, when we purchased the properties, we did not purchase them with the intention to separate the properties. That's one thing I want to make clear because that was mentioned in um, both briefs and everything. We didn't purchase them that way. It was only after we were told by our attorney, by the way, you know, there's no formal easement. Okay, all right, you should get an easement because you don't have the legal right to have that sewer pipe go, go under the common land. So we went to the association, asked them if we could get a legal easement, and they said no. Uh, they said no, you have the letter there, uh, they said no because um, the original bylaws they felt um, didn't give them the right to uh, give one owner um, rights over the common land that another didn't have. But as it turns out, they didn't have the right to grant an easement period because it turned out that the homeowners association had never been incorporated. All right, so that brought that up. They did incorporate several months later. I forget how much later. But anyway, they told us they would not give us an easement. Um, I explained to them that um, Lisa Newbold had told me that um, she was given permission by the association to run that pipe. Um, she said uh, it was when Ralph Pride was the president of the association. Uh, Ralph Pride still resides in Delano Park, but I believe he didn't remember. Apparently, the, the records from the Delano Park Association for 1997 have been misplaced. And that <coughs> probably is when he would have given her that. I spoke to Lisa myself a couple days ago, and she said she thought he had even written something that said you have the... Uh, parks uh, permission it would be a temporary position that they could remove that's good thing. but it wasn't a recorded easement in the registry but there was no recorded easement so then when we asked for the recorded easement they said we couldn't get a recorded easement so I went to Bruce met with Bruce Smith and said um, what are my options here because I can't um, I can't make that sewer pipe legal so when I go to sell this property you know, shame on me for not getting it done when I bought it, but in order for me to transfer a title, I, need, I should have an easement there. So he said, well, and, and at this point in time, I also discovered that there had been, there was no restriction recorded in the deed. Lisa had said she would do it, but she just didn't do it. It was just an oversight on her part, as she's told me. So Bruce said, Bruce and I discussed it, my attorney discussed it, and they said if there was never any deed restriction done, and now you've been <coughs> denied the right to, um, you know, to have legal access over there that would carry to a, on a permanent basis, uh, what are the other options? 
And Mr. Smith said, well, you know, you've already got the septic tank and the pump on the little lot. Um, nowadays, they have these very small systems. It's a one to two bedroom, 26 row L, I forget what it is, but it's in your packet. Um, it requires state approval, but he said that's something that could be done on the lot. And then you'd ha it would be on its own for several reasons, none of which were our doing. In other words, we just sort of reacted to the things that happened. Um, Albert Frick was hired by us to come out and do the design. Um, Albert Frick discussed it with Bruce Smith. The design says single family dwelling on it. It does not say in law like the first, the old one did. But did, did Bruce say that the restriction uh, no longer applied? Yes, okay. because there was another way to get it on the law. Yes, okay. he did. The reason it applied was just because he didn't want to leave the law. So what I'm trying to get at was, it, was there a prior restriction that potentially is applicable to you that uh, the restriction was then waived by uh, the town uh, official later on? In, I would saying, say yes. It you're saying verbally needed. yes, he did waive it. Yes, he so, said, you, go ahead. So I'd like to move to some of the other accessory uh, structure issues. Uh, if I may. So your argument is that it can't be an accessory building because it's not on the same lot as the principal build as what has been called the principal building, the other house, mm -hmm. correct? So it can't. And the other counter argument is that it can't be a dwelling unit because it lacked plumbing. So correct? Well, did you, did, would, you, would you agree with that? At least that's the argument that's being raised. So my question that I'm going to try to get at here is what is it? And I would not agree with your second assertion that it's not a dwelling unit. I mean, it's been found to be a dwelling unit. And, and again, Mr. McDougall's letter said it's a grandfathered uh, apartment. We can agree it doesn't meet the actual letter of what is a dwelling unit under the code now, which required toilet facilities. It has an iteration of requirements, one of which was well, And that goes facilities. back to the grandfathering many years ago. They still don't understand. We can agree that at the time this ordinance came into effect, it did not meet the criteria of a dwelling unit. So it might qualify as a dwelling unit because it existed prior to the, this, this definition of the ordinance, but when the definition went into effect, it did not meet this criteria. But I would also point out, as you are arguing, that it doesn't meet the criteria of an accessory building. So I'm asking you if you can tell me what it is under the, does it meet any criteria under the text of this ordinance? And I understand your argument that it's a, um, grandfather dwelling unit and what I'm trying to get at is does it qualify as a grandfather dwelling unit simply by virtue of the fact that it meets no other criteria in this ordinance uh, well again as I mentioned that mr. McDougall and others have found this to be a grandfather dwelling unit so I if it's not an accessory unit it just leaves it as a dwelling unit which I think clearly makes it a single family dwelling unit under the RA zone well, right. You understand that we're reviewing the decisions of the code enforcement officer. So Mr. McDougall, his decision correct. is not necessarily binding on us here. So you have to convince us that it's a grandfather dwelling unit. So I want to know what is it here? Is it a, if it's a grandfather dwelling unit, you have to convince me that it's no other criteria in this. Well, again, th that would assume that my underlying premise that you really don't have jurisdiction to go back and review that, uh, that you would disagree with that assertion. So I do admit that if you go back, that I don't know when's the grandfathering date uh, late for the 60s. late 60s. That the the history going back on this property is is admittedly murky. Uh, I think that was the term uh, Ben used uh, when in his uh, opening presentation. Uh, so yes, that that's difficult. But again, despite that, again, three code enforcement officers have found this to be a lawfully non-conforming dwelling unit. Let's try to t attack this from a different angle. If you, have a, if you have a garage sitting on a lot and there's no other structure on the lot, what is that structure what, under, our under our code? Well, that seems like a, a rhetorical question. Well, Certainly a garage, yeah. That seems to be what the but issue I, really but is. But I here. would propose what if uh, three code enforcement officers said it was a single family dwelling? It needs to be clarified. So I, I say uh, you know, I go. May I say something? It, it's been dwelled in since the mid-90s. It, it has been used as a dwelling. So I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you trying to say that there's nothing there now? 
There's been a living no, no. unit there for those number of years, so for, before we bought it. If, if we do not assign deference to the, CE, the different CEOs' prior interpretations as to what this structure is, and we decide for ourselves what this structure is, we have to figure out what the structure is. So the way that we would normally do that is we would look at the definitions and the criteria for the definitions, and we would try to assign it into one of the permitted uses in the, in the RA district. It, in my opinion, doesn't meet accessory building or structure because there's no principal building or structure on the same lot. In my opinion, it also doesn't meet dwelling unit by virtue of the fact that it lacked plumbing when it was put in in the late 90s, it sounds like. It lacked plumbing when the first, uh, when Lisa Newbold's system was done? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. So by virtue of that, and this code existed at the time, it didn't meet dwelling unit at that time. But the building, obviously, it predates the, our ordinance. Yep. Yes, so it does. What I'm trying to get from you is an argument if we set aside what the CEOs have said, why is it a grandfather dwelling unit and not anything else under the ordinance? I can tell you. Well, I can tell you what I found out about the history of the building prior to, um, as my attorney mentioned, the oldest piece of paper in the building file for this. The very first one is dated September 1996. And it's a letter from Lisa Newbold to Ernie McVeigh, saying, thank you so much for helping me in, you know, in all these ins and outs with this as if they'd been working on it. And she says, as we've discussed before, uh, with your permission, I want to have my septic, my new design changed. So instead of just dealing with the main house and a five bedroom system, I want my plan changed, which you and I have discussed, she says, on many occasions, my house will be a four, the four bedroom and then there'll be a one bedroom in-law garage apartment in the little building. And with your permission, I'll continue to have it plumb. Now that's the oldest document in there. I talked to Lisa and I said, I got to believe you, you were obviously talking to him before then. And she said, yes, I was. All I did, and there's nothing to prove this other than what these people have told me, all I did was complete what Roger Putnam had started quite a while ago because when Lisa bought the house, the garage had a kitchen in it with electricity, it had a, it had a bathroom sort of just with the toilet, it was waiting to have plumbing done. And Roger hadn't done that. So I do know that much. Lisa got the water in. She got it livable in 97. I don't know if that helps at all, but. If anyone else has any other questions? And just also for the record, I didn't just start to sell the property this pet this three or four months ago, I think, my friend said. That my property has been on the, on and off the market, the big house. Unfortunately, since 2007, I had it listed four different times or five different times. I've forgotten, and I'm, the, I'm a real estate agent. I only ever had the main house for sale. So it shouldn't have been a surprise to the other neighbors in Delano that that's all I was selling because every single time I'd had it on the market, it was always the big house. And it wasn't just until this past December when I was approached by several of the um, trustees saying, you know, we'd like to know what your intention is. Do you plan on selling these separately? And I said, I've always planned on that. Every time it's been on the market, that's how it's been offered. So I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from any of the board members for the applicant? OK. Um, why don't we turn to the uh, public comment uh, portion of the, the presentation. And uh, I know we have a couple of uh, attorneys representing various neighbors. So I would like to step to the microphone. And Thank you. Good evening. I'm Bruce McLaughlin. Am I speaking loud enough? 
Uh, I'm, an attorney, <laughs> I'm an attorney representing a number of residents of Delano Park who are neighbors of the applicant. Uh, specifically, I represent John Staples, Scott Raspa, James and Nancy Martin, Arlen and Jennifer Marshall, Sarah Ladazensky, Cray Sims, uh, Robert and Linda Koppelman, Shanna Schrader, and Charles Lee, who are all on record opposing this appeal. I'm not going to repeat the analysis I put in my written submission, although I may need to go back over some of it in response to some of the statements that were made here tonight. Uh, I would like to briefly comment on some just general principles of zoning law that are at play in this, this appeal. I mean, there's a, there's a very, very, very fundamental principle of zoning law that nonconformities are to be decreased and eliminated whenever possible and not increased or expanded. And that's based on a, a principle of fairness. Uh, for for uh, nonconformities that are grandfathered, we acknowledge that we don't retroactively apply the rules to those properties and we allow those grandfathered non-conforming uses to continue. But after the rules go into effect, any change or development of any property, including the non-conforming properties, have to apply equally to the rules of the ordinance. It's, that's fairness too. It would be totally unfair to the other property owners if the non-conforming lots get to continue to ignore the rules. They're allowed to, to the extent that they existed before the ordinance, but afterwards the rules apply equally. And it would be unfair in this case to my clients and other neighbors in Delano Park, Delano Park, <coughs> to allow this request of the applicants to go forward. <coughs> They've basically requested that this non-conforming lot with a non-conforming structure and a non-conforming use be allowed to be developed further. The historical record is a little bit murky. I think the term murky has been used a couple of times here tonight. <coughs> it's not clearly established, I don't think, in the documents that the lot did pre-exist the ordinance, that the structure pre-existed the ordinance, but I think there's general consensus that that's true. So the lot and the structure are considered grandfathered legally existing uh, zoning characteristics. The use, however, I think there's general consensus that it did not pre-exist the ordinance, is not a grandfathered use, can't be considered a grandfathered dwelling or a grandfathered dwelling unit or any other kind of... W would you dispute that... Um it was a seasonal dwelling with no plumbing historically? Uh, I don't think there's anything in the record that it was that at the time the ordinance was enacted. What, uh, is, so you would, you would say that there's no evidence that it was ever a seasonal dwelling with no plumbing prior to adoption of the ordinance? Right, and it is the applicant's burden to, to prove that legal non-conforming status. <coughs> So it seems to me that it's pretty clear that we have a non-conforming lot, non-conforming structure, and a, an apartment use with some plumbing as of 1997 that was allowed by either Mr. McVeigh or Mr. Smith <coughs> or both. <laughs> as I've explained in my written submission, I, I don't understand how anybody can read the record and not come to the conclusion that it was allowed as an accessory dwelling unit. <clears throat> and Mr. McDougall has correctly interpreted as such that that was an allowance as an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, Tom, Mr. Jewell is absolutely correct. Such a use is not proper in the ordinance accordingly. Mr. McDougall has concluded that the approval as such back in 1997 was not legally authorized. So at that point in time, you've got a use that was improperly authorized by the code enforcement officer. It was not authorized by the zoning ordinance. 
And I believe Mr. McDougal is generously characterizing that now as a um, non-conforming use that he's uh, willing to allow to exist because of the decision that was made by the code enforcement officer back in 1997. But it was that decision, when was that decision in 1997? What date? Uh, I don't have it. Was it but before it would be or after June 4th? June 4th. And what, what would be the significance of that date? Well, I'm looking at section 19-4-3A to B non-conforming lots and the provisions applicable to contiguous developed lots, which provides that two or more contiguous developed non-conforming lots or parcels in common ownership as of June 4, 1997 may be conveyed separately or together, even if all or some of the lots do not meet the dimensional requirements of this ordinance, if a principal use or structure exists on each lot. Well, if I, if I understand, I don't have that section in front of me, but if I understand what you're saying, first of all, these are not contiguous lots. Okay. And the garage is not a principal structure. Is the, what separates them just the road? The uh, private road? I th somebody else can give a better account of that. They're Maybe David, when David. There's a whole other lot in between them. Yeah. <clears throat> so basically, historically, the horse barns are all put down together away from everyone's houses or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Right. In, in, in that light, I think it's important to recognize that this micro lot is one of four micro lots that were created, I believe, after the original subdivision. This is not your typical grandfathered lot, which is one of many similar or identical lots in a subdivision, all, all being cre created with the intent of developing a house lot on it. These were specifically created as carriage house lots or garage lots. The other three of the four continue to be used for that intended use of a garage or carriage house. This lot is the only one that has been, I would argue, erroneously allowed to be used otherwise with an apartment above the garage. So the other three are simply gar garages or horse barns, if you will? No. no. It, let's hear from that then. No, no, no. I'll, I'll have uh, the president of the trustees, Bill Laverty, sure. speak. My name is Bill Laverty. I'm president of the Board of Trustees. Um, the, there are four lots in that one lot that was divided, 46 A, B, C, and D. Um, one has a structure on it that is a garage structure or a carriage house structure, most likely because it was uh, built that way up above the ground. There's a garage with a dwelling above it. On the furthest lot that goes out to Shore Road, is, which is owned by the people, that they're owned separately. So A is on the road that's owned by one person in, the, in there. Their lot is owned by them. The next lot is owned by the same people out here with a carriage house, and then they own the next lot. So there's four lots. None of them are contiguous to each other as to ownership. There is one other lot that has a large carriage house, carriage house on it. The one on the road has never been um, done anything with. And the other lot that they have, I don't know what's there. I thought it was a septic system, but I do not know that. So, so for clarity, is there another lot that has a dwelling unit in it? No. Oh, OK. So this is the only one of the four that has a dwelling unit. OK. OK, that was the question. Yeah. But the main point was these were not created as house lots. Uh, understood. Uh, exhibit A to the appellant's submission and exhibit, which is from 1996, July 22nd, 1996, and exhibit B from September 9th, 1997, both refer to the building as having a pre-existing garage apartment. So the, just so you're aware, the record has, as of July 22nd, 1996, at least there was a representation in a letter from the owner at the time that there was a garage apartment in existence at the time in the garage. Right. I understand there's some reference in the record that, that the apartment use might have pre-existed without plumbing. But I don't think there's anything in the record to establish that it pre-existed back to 58 or whenever the ordinance was enacted. 
Um, <clears throat> so the, the decision in 97 was, I believe, correctly characterized by Mr. McDougall, and he can correct me if I'm mischaracterizing him, was an illegal, unauthorized decision under the ordinance. Um, and for that reason, it has to be considered generously, I think, a non-conforming use. What's particularly alarming, I think, about this case is that the applicants are relying on this improper prior decision that created a nonconformity to allow a greater nonconformity. And that just can't be. I mean, it can't be when we have a fundamental principle of zoning law that we don't want to increase nonconformities to, to allow a previous mistake that created a nonconformity to be the basis for allowing this mistake. Under our ordinance, setting aside the interpretations from the various CEOs, under our ordinance, how do you characterize a garage that is on a lot with no other building? It's got to be a garage, I guess. Well, is it an accessory structure? Is it a uh, dwelling unit? It, it needs to fall into one of the criteria. How, how should we categorize a garage by itself on a lot? Well, first of all, I don't know exactly what the word said back in 1997 or... or and, re and regardless, the garage is, non is a non-conforming grandfathered structure. So I'm not sure you need to it's figure just, out what it is. From my perspective, it seems like there may, there, it's a little murky, as the, the appellants noted. It's unclear what all was occurring there. But at least as of 1996, there potentially was a seasonal dwelling akin to a camp that you find all over Maine that didn't have any plumbing. And such a <clears> seasonal dwelling is often considered a, a, a livable unit where uh, towns will let someone come in and put plumbing and turn it into a year-round building. So such seasonal dwelling units are often, such seasonal structures are often considered dwelling units. And that's the angle I'm currently coming at this question from, unless you can explain to me why it should not be considered a grandfathered dwelling, which is basically what the prior CEO characterized it as. Well. This, that's what you've been told tonight, well, what he characterized. I don't think there's anything written in the record saying that. So what I see is a lot that existed that is clearly a nonconforming lot, a structure that's existed for decades, that at least as far back as 1996 had an apartment in it that someone was occupying without plumbing. But that can't be a dwelling unit under our definition unless it has toilet facilities. So if it predates that definition as a seasonal unit, I would deem that a grandfathered dwelling unit, which is in effect what the prior I don't CEO know what the definition was. was. Yeah. I will say that it might help you to look at the definition of principal building, which would include even a garage. I know we normally think of a garage as an accessory, <clears throat> but it, the definition of principal building is broad enough to include just a garage. And, uh, I think it's important to, to reiterate that tonight there's been a number of phrases and words presented to the board that find no basis that I'm aware of in the written record, nor are they used in the written submission by the applicants. I don't believe there's anything in the written submission that says there's a grandfathered single family dwelling. I, I didn't see that. I don't, maybe I'm misremembering. But there is definitely nothing in the written, town's written record that calls it a grandfathered single-family dwelling. If you go to Mr. Smith's November 2005 letter to Ms. Guthrie, which I understood the written submission of the applicants to be almost based completely on that letter, that letter does not refer to a dwelling. It doesn't say grandfathered. It says a dwelling unit. That doesn't, uh, doesn't exclude the possibility of an accessory dwelling unit, and it's not a dwelling. The, the, the permitted use in this RA zone that might be applicable here is a dwelling, not a dwelling unit. And I don't think there's anything in the record indicating that historically or, or at any any time, 
this was more than an upstairs apartment over the garage. And clearly, that was the case in 97 and in 2005. All of the documents in 97 time period, as I think reiterated in 2005 and 2006, uh, Mr. Frick's letter to the state in 2006 clearly says this is an accessory dwelling unit, in-law apartment, accessory to the principal dwelling on lot 44. It's just unmistakable. Now I'm getting back into what I say in my written submission, but I kind of feel the need to because of all the statements that were made here tonight. Uh, Let me ask you a question. I, I, sure. Maybe it, it has no significance. I'm not sure. You tell me. Exhibit M to their submission is this executive committee meeting minutes from May 6, 2006, and they talk about converted carriage house, and they're talking about tax records for 46A and 3B. Going back, I guess, I mean, it, it speaks for itself. I'll, I'll let you read it to the extent that you, haven't, that you don't have it in front of you. I'll let you look at it. I guess I'm trying to figure out <clears throat> how do you reconcile, if anything, with, with what the, the... So this is the letter from Al Frick to Russell uh, Martin? No, sir. The, the, oh. I have it as Exhibit M as in Mike. M. Okay. I'm sorry. Not a problem. And this is the executive committee meeting, Correct. May 6. Um, I one of the documents I passed around is a subsequent note by one of the trustees in June of 2006, sending the vote that was taken in this meeting. And in fact, um, and Mr. Laverty, if need be, can confirm this. The lot was never assessed. Lot 46A was never assessed. So the representation made in the written submissions by the applicants suggesting that this, uh, after this, this point in time from Exhibit M, that it's been treated as, as a single family dwelling assessed as such is just not true. Well, isn't it an admission basically by the Delano Park Association that the town had indeed considered it a one family residence at this point in time? And despite the rescission that occurred later on after receiving advice from council, they nevertheless made the statement at their well, meeting and adopted it in the <clears> minutes. It's, it's an admission only to the extent that whoever wrote these minutes characterized the conversation this way among a bunch of layperson trustees understanding things as they, however they might have understood them at the time. But... It, so their belief that it was a, that it was a residence based on... on and, I, and I know what you're going to... I'm going to... I already know where you're going with it. Let me just... <laughs> let me finish. The, the, the belief, whether mistaken or not, that it was a residence based on tax records, subsequent or a, a, after this, this rescission from August 4, 2006, basically was negating this belief that they had because the tax records weren't... wasn't accurate in the first place. Uh, well, I would say the best you could conclude from this is that these trustees understood that somebody was living there, as, and I don't think no, anybody was disputing that. As of 1997, obviously, somebody was living there, okay? But that doesn't mean it's a dwelling under your zoning ordinance, or it's a grandfather dwelling under your zoning ordinance. And after they talked to an attorney, apparently, they, it was explained to them that somebody might interpret that exactly the way you're suggesting, and they were, yeah, oh, we don't want that, so they corrected it. But it certainly doesn't have any, I mean, if the CEO's decision isn't binding on you, certainly the, the trustee's understanding of whatever might have existed at that time is, is certainly not binding on you or how you interpret your own. Well, I guess, I guess find it, you know, the, the, there is a, a certain level of <clears throat> symmetry because you do have an Exhibit G at the conclusion of Mr. Smith's November 9th letter, an acknowledgement that there is a garage and a one, therefore, in answer to your question, there's a garage and a one family dwelling unit existing on lot 46A. And then we go to Exhibit M, um, which are the minutes you know, effectively six months later, um, but you're acknowledging that the town has more or less determined that that, that is, that that 
dwelling is a, is a quote unquote residence. Well, uh, for better, uh, better or worse. I mean, if, if I were you, I would prefer to rely on your code enforcement officer's interpretation of this letter rather than the trustees. And the letter says it's a garage with a dwelling unit. It doesn't say it's a dwelling. I guess that's the part I keep struggling with, too, is that the, everything that I'm reading says that, hey, there's someone living up there. There's a bedroom up there. There's, you know, septic for it. But we're considering it a dwelling unit only to the extent that it's linked to the other property. We're not considering it a separate dwelling unit. And that's that distinction between accessory and principal is what I'm continuing to struggle with, especially now that they are in legally separate ownership. Right. Ha what happens to that dependency that we've established historically now that they have been sold separately? Do you then magnify that nonconformity by saying, that's okay, we're gonna let you now make it into a house too? I think that's a good word, magnify. That's what's happened incrementally here. There's been magnifications of nonconformities, and, and Mr. McDougall has correctly put the brakes on that. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, I would consider, I think the applicants should be happy with Mr. McDougall's conclusion that this is at least allowed to continue to exist despite a number of, of uh, improprieties or, or however you want to characterize them in the past. Speaking of which, um, uh, and I understand that the, the applicants haven't had a chance to uh, review Mr. Bischoff's letter, but I just would like to reiterate a point he makes, which is <clears throat> that I think there's a good case to be made, and I'll let him expand on this, but there's a good case to be made that the, 19, no, the 2006 permit from the state, which by the way is not a town permit, was never properly uh, extended. It expired in 2008. The um, septic wasn't expanded until 2009. So there's a good case to be made that that, that permit wasn't even properly uh, uh, implemented or, or authorized. David, do you have something to add to that? Because before he leaves <laughs> that point, if you want to add anything to it, you might as well just go ahead and yes. keep going. Thank you. I'm uh, David Bischoff. I represent uh, the Hoops and Brill family um, that owns uh, property in Delano Park, um, including all of the property surrounding 46A, uh, except for the common road, the road that passes it. Um, and it was an oversight if uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Jewell and his partner didn't receive my submission at the same time. However, valuable that submission was, you can still make your decision tonight without considering it. Um, and our, what, what fundamentally my submission did was to adopt and incorporate by reference um, Mr. McLaughlin's submission and then also to address the issue of the permits associated with the 1996-97 installation of the um, septic system that required the effluent lines. That was the first issue that I addressed. The second issue is uh, to address the issuance of the permit in 2006, pursuant to which the now existing septic system was installed in late December 2009. And so on that point, the application, and it's, it's in the submissions uh, as exhibits, but the application to the state originally was made in October, October 19, 2006, following a letter from uh, Mr. Frick to Mr. Martin of the D Department of Environmental Health saying, we talked about this issue. You told me, Mr. Martin, that this system would qualify as a replacement system, notwithstanding the con concession that at that time, the applicants did not have right title and interest to the entirety of the system for which they were seeking a variance to replace. So they did not have right title and interest to the effluent lines that passed over the common road out over to lot 44, what I call the big house. Um, so, so wait, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Um, the new septic for the what I'm going to call the little lot, so I don't have yeah. to keep the numbers straight, 
was installed as a replacement system for a portion of the septic existing on the big lot. Yes, that's correct. Now, then did they add the bedrooms back in on the big lot? So then they have a yes. five? Yes, they did, very, very shortly after. Um, so that application, notwithstanding its flaws, it also wasn't signed. But nonetheless, as I address in my submission, uh, notwithstanding those flaws, the permit issued from the state, and um, uh, Mr. Smith received the permit, as he is uh, proper to do, and it looks like he issued the, the permit from the town uh, on January 7th, um, uh, 2007. I'm sorry, uh, yes, 2008. No, I've got those numbers wrong. It's in my sh submission. But in any event, two, almost two years after the permit was issued by the state, and this permit is only of two years duration, it expires at the end of two years, um, Ms. Dallas um, uh, sent an email to Mr. Smith and requested an extension, a one-year extension of the permit that was issued by the state, the Department of Environmental Health. Uh, Mr. Smith and again, this is the only record in the file associated with this extension. Mr. Smith emailed back saying that he put the request with your septic design, you're all set, till January 7, 2010. Um, I submit that Mr. Smith didn't have authority to issue that extension at that time. And so when, and this isn't uh, disputed, um, when in late December 2009, the septic system was installed, it was done so on an expired permit. Although that was three years ago, at least, 2000. Yeah, but, and, and, and importantly, um, my, that was the installation of the septic system was my client's first knowledge of any issue associated with a su sufficient septic system. And they didn't challenge uh, the code enforcement officer's uh, extension or the installation of they the had no knowledge of it time. well they knew it was being installed you just said that they had knowledge only after the fact and again it's but they didn't then challenge it within 30 days of receiving actual notice that it well was well constructive notice your honor yeah well yes constructive notice but the part of the problem is that um, Delano Park is historically uh, made up of summer homes uh, my clients uh, our family they don't live here they live in California New York um, New Mexico uh, Massachusetts, they didn't see it until they got back here. So, so the problem, and this has happened with some of the other appeals, is there needs to be some level of finality that exists in the world. So we, we can't have the ability for people to come in and challenge decisions that were made 5, 10, 50, 20, 50, 100 years ago. There has to be some level of finality, which is why we have this window of time that you can appeal a decision or raise a violation once you become aware of it in a situation like this, when it's based on a decision of the CEO. Sure. And here they knew for at least a good number of years and never challenged it. They clearly didn't challenge it within 30 days of finding out about the fact that the septic system. That's conceded and that's absolutely true. Um, so, uh, there, it, there have been discussions with the, with the code enforcement officer. Our position here is that we're opposing the appeal. I think Mr. McDougall, and, and I'll back up and say that my clients initially wanted to move to have the uh, septic system completely ripped out and the use revert to that of the garage. Um, uh, Mr. McDougall heard my argument on that. Uh, and then he issued his decision, which we're here um, to defend against this appeal. Could you touch on the timely? Uh, go ahead. Yes, sir. Against what? This appeal. Okay. We're here in opposition to the appeal. Can you touch on the timeliness of the appeal? It, it, do you have any argument? Do, do you have a serious yeah. argument that they don't get the one-day extension by virtue? Yeah, no, of it's a very strict argument. It's uh, one that certainly is uh, at your discretion to I I enforce or not. Um, I, I think that it makes, well, let me back up. Ordinarily, uh, as people have commented in court and other proceedings, and certainly in other towns, it, there's a provision that permits you to file something on the next business day if the deadline falls on a holiday or on a, uh, on a, sun, on a Saturday or a Sunday. Uh, the ordinance doesn't call for that. So a strict application of your ordinance does make this appeal untimely. Now, that is an argument. Certainly you've got your discretion to exercise uh, its enforcement or not. Uh, fundamentally, though, the, pro the, pro the problem that my clients have with this is that um, on this tiny, tiny lot, a 4,000 square foot lot, a garage has morphed into um, a, 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 an accessory dwelling, what's been deemed to be an accessory dwelling with an apartment above, and with a separate septic system that is jammed into this very small lot. 
um, to, now to now permit the appellants to uh, further their pursuit and to convert it to a single fam family home on this very, very small lot um, is something that my clients uh, strenuously object to, and which is why I've appeared and made my submission. Again, if, uh, uh, you know, I'll say, I'll, I'll take Tom at his word, um, if the submission didn't make it to Tom or to Paul, uh, that's my oversight again, though. At the same time, I think a review of what uh, Mr. McDougall did here would show that it was a constructive and well thought out and carefully uh, constructed decision about a very difficult problem that he inherited. Um, and at the same time, that uh, some issues here are very clear and not in dispute. We've got some very good factual record with regard to certain parts of this. Um, what Mr. McDougall inherited really was a mess. And he made, in our opinion, a very constructive interpretation of the situation. And I'll say this, my clients were seeking to enforce the provision. Um, that, requ <clears throat> that required the two lots, 44 and 46A, to remain in singular ownership. Uh, there was a suggestion that uh, it really wasn't a serious, that it really wasn't a serious requirement. But I have a letter, and I could submit it. I don't have copies for the witnesses, but uh, or for the other parties. But um, a copy from Ms. Newbold, who said um, on uh, se what looks like September 29th, 1997, I will do whatever pa paperwork is required to have this registered properly. Uh, prior to that, she said, I'd like it clearly stated in the registry of deeds that these two lots have been and will remain in sing single ownership. I sought to have a ruling, a, a decision from Mr. McDougall that required the singular ownership. Mr. McDougall, looking at the circumstances, and I'm, I don't mean to speak for him, um, I believe considered that there was a purchase and sale agreement on lot 44, the bigger house, and he came up with a constructive solution that I think is as uh, faithful to your ordinance as could be done, while also taking into consideration the uncertainty of certain aspects of this record. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I just, oh, sorry. I'm just, if I could, I just wrap up real quick with three points. Mm -hmm. It's the applicant's burden with this murky record. Rules about uh, nonconformities are to be strictly construed and strictly applied against those seeking to get an expansion. And as uh, Mr. Bischoff has said uh, Mr. McDougall's decision is uh, basically impeccable and based on the written record and, and I don't think can be credibly uh, challenged based on the written record. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you wish to speak, please. In, uh, not to interrupt what yeah. you're going to say, but uh, if you could touch on what's the farthest back evidence you have that this unit, w that this structure was dwelled in. Is it 1996, or can you point to anything earlier than that? If you could touch on that. Um, well. From documents, I would say it's the seasonal, it's the oldest, but admittedly it does not say this, it says there's no plumbing. Uh, so separate from the plumbing, imagine it's a, your standard main camp. All right. In the I, no plumbing. The no house in the backyard. Card. The card. The assessor's so we card. We don't have that in the record. So if you want that in the record, you. Okay. I, I have it right here. The assessor's card calls it a seasonal, and that was. I'm not sure how they date them. It looks like it was done twice in '79 and '93. I can't tell which was done when. So it's up to you whether you want to submit that to us. I'll submit it. That's fine. I know from. It, it, until, until you hand it Could to you. I know from speaking to people who knew the prior owner, spent time there, it was a place for the, te for the Putnam's teenagers is what it was, and that was their intention to do that, and so they started finishing it off thinking they, anyway. It, Did you? Until we have that card, you have not submitted right. it into the record, and we don't have any evidence that it's been a seasonal dwelling since the 70s, so. Sure. Yeah. Can I make a point about that? I yes. Uh, seat, I think. Ben would like to make a point. Go ahead. Re regarding the assessing record, I did go over the assessing record extensively with our assessor, who's been here since the late 90s, and he and he noted the May 17, 1994 note on the assessing card: garage quarters, 
not usable, no disposal system, no plumbing, not used. That is the 1994 assessing characterization. The characteriz characterization of seasonal living quarters came after that. So the record in 94 indicated that it existed, but said that it had fallen into disuse in effect. Because it sounds like no plumbing from that perspective, but again, is this a main camp of the old days with garage quarters? And, and, and what he said is it was probably carpeted for a game room for kids to go up and play. But I, I don't think that constitutes a dwelling unit to allow your kids to go play above the garage. But again, we're right now at speculation. So if there's something from the 70s from the town saying it was a seasonal dwelling, that would be. There, there is not. There, there's, there's nothing. Again, there's nothing in the rec. The earliest record in the building file is Lisa Newbold's letter, September 96. So, so just a, mo a few moments ago, you were talking about something from the 70s. That is just based on my knowledge, what Got people it. have told me who were there. There's nothing in the record. Yep. There's not a piece of paper that predates that letter, so. That's why we asked for the paper. Okay, that's why Ben was left with this task, because there's no, there was no file, or the file existed and it was misplaced in the change of. So the, the only indication that it was a seasonal dwelling back in the 70s is your speculation based on conversations with the prior owners. Well, that says it on the card. I don't know when it was put on the card. That card pretty much represents what Lisa told me was the situation when she purchased it as well, that it was in the process. You see there's electricity there. Um, the second floor had been sheetrocked and there were floor, there's flooring in, et cetera. It was in mid-process. Still perusing, Chris? Yeah, go ahead, though. OK. Um, do, uh, does anyone have any questions on the board, Barry? No. Um, I had a couple things I wanted to just correct and clarify for the record. Okay. Sure. OK. Um, the, um, there was mention made that there was no town permit issued. There was a town permit issued. It wasn't submitted as an exhibit. I have it here. I think, um, I'm not sure who just said that, one of the, David, that um, it was only the state. There, is a, there was a town permit issued. First it was signed off by the state, as is required, and then it was signed off on by the town. Uh, and I did file for the extension um, to get the extra year's extension uh, because my house hadn't sold, so I didn't, you know, I wasn't really sure where I was going with it. Hadn't sold, so. This is, this is for the, the uh, sewer permit. This is for the leach field to go on the site. Now, there was also some mention made about um, where the leach field is located, that it wasn't on my lot or something. Could you? Yeah, that's incorrect. <laughs> Excuse me? That it's not? What? Oh, not you, not you. It was one of the attorneys. If it'll make you feel better, we didn't hear that. Good. Okay. It's on. It's all. It's on one. It's all on 46A. Okay, and it may be little, but it met the requirements for the state. It's not the type of thing that could even be allowed on a local level. It had to go to the state, and I went that route. Um, as far as any indication in the file, or in, yeah, in the file, that it was considered anything other than an accessory dwelling unit or an in-law apartment, 
The permits that um, were done for the septic when Lisa Newbold did hers in 96, 97 on the septic permit, and you have those in your exhibits, where it says disposal system to serve right in the middle of the application. There's boxes to check, and the third one says other. And on those with leases, it was typed in in law apartment. When my permit was done on every application, whether it was the initial one, it was reviewed, it had to be updated by Al Frick because of the time factor. We were aware that it's not good forever, so we had, Al had to come in and review it again and say, okay, it still works. He's redated it and redated it. All of those say system, system disposal system to serve single family dwelling unit. So it is, it does show on this. Uh, so that to me was some indication that the town, that the authorities were considering it that and not an in-law anymore. Is that the subsurface disposal permit? Yes. Aren't those the only choices? You've either got an industrial one or you've got a residential no. one? There's no. There's, you have it, I don't know what exhibit it is in your packet, but there's three boxes. Number one says single family dwelling unit, number of bedrooms. Box two says multiple multiple family, number three says other, and there's a blank. Mm -hmm. And What else when, would you be putting a septic in other than something where people were living? On leases, it said in-law apartment because it was considered an other. I mean, I guess you'd have to ask uh, Mr. Frick that, but he, her application clearly stated in-law apartment. My applications clearly say the use is for a single family dwelling. And since that's what we're here to discuss, that was one of the things that I relied on. So from my perspective, your 1979 property card is probably your strongest argument. You basically have the property card says that the first floor basement is used for garage. It then says under type dwelling, it lists the grade and everything else that it has. But at the same time, it then says occupancy garage. So it's both characterizing it mm -hmm. as a dwelling unit as garage. So it indicates there's some dwelling going on in the 70s. But the problem you have to overcome is you then have a comment in 1994 in the card indicating that uh, that use is discontinued. So, Which I can't explain, so goes away. I just know what happened Grandfather from yeah. 96 forward. However, as far as what I relied on, um, mistakenly we did not mention in the brief all the meetings that I had with Code Officer Smith. Um, I do have a copy of some of the appointments were act actually booked ahead, so there's notes. Um, we did discuss it. I'm not even sure how many times I met with him. Every time he met, when he met with the architect, he met um, to, to discuss what could be done with a single family dwelling. And just to clarify here, it may be clear to you, but I'm not sure that it's clear to my neighbors that are having such an issue with this. Um, we're talking about my wish to expand. Um, I know that I can't expand the footprint. I know that if I want to redo this building, basically the building is a dump. I want to do something to it. And I, in fact, I met with Ben about the second week into his new employment here, showed him my drawings, and said, this is what I want to do to this. If it's a single family dwelling, which I have it characterized as, and I can finish the bottom floor as well. You're allowed to do that with a single family dwelling. So I could make a nice looking, you have some renderings, I just did a couple to give you an idea. I can create a property that has about 1,350 square feet, that has a faux carriage door look on it, no garage space, it would be two bedrooms, two baths, it would actually improve the value of the neighborhood because that would be a property that's probably worth in the 400 Ms. easily. That's a little beyond the scope of what Okay, we're about well, tonight. I want to clarify expansion then, okay? My goal is not to expand anymore on that lot. I know I can't go beyond that footprint, so I'm not sure what my neighbors think, but that's not what I mean by expansion. Okay. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to close the hearing. Yeah, we're going to, uh, any questions? Okay. Okay, we're going to close the, uh, the public comment section of the, of the uh, hearing and uh, move on to the uh, much anticipated board deliberations. I, I think the first issue has to be, do we have, was the appeal timely? 
Can I answer that two ways? <laughs> um, I agree. I think we need to address the timeliness issue first. Um, uh, I know that the, that the code says it's a strict 30 days. Uh, the 30 days fell on a Sunday. Uh, I'm going to, from my perspective, I'm going to employ, employ the common sense uh, rule, which is uh, if, it was, if it was received on that Monday or the 31st day, then I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with the time. I don't have a timeliness issue from my perspective. I agree with you. I would like to say that, you know, our ordinance doesn't allow us to do that. There's no provision in there that says we can give you that extra day, like is in rules of civil procedure and that kind of thing. I'm willing to do it here, but I think if we were to see that as a pattern, we would certainly want to revisit whether we're giving those kind of extensions without authority in the ordinance. Well, if I would uh, say that we don't have, uh, that it was untimely if we deem it us providing an extension, because I don't believe we have the power to issue an extension. So I would like for us to decide, just as a general matter, if the deadline falls on a weekend or a holiday, do we interpret the code as permitting filing on the very next business day? I'd like to consider it that way. If the rest uh, of the I, 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 I don't. I think that if, you, if, if the 30th day falls on a holiday or a weekend, then you go to the, next, the first business day thereafter. That's, that's my view. I, I would agree. Although they're rather suddenly in, in the 30 days, but irrelevant. I, I would agree that uh, we do indeed accept this because the 30th day is on a Sunday. For not to opine <laughs> on that question. <laughs> Jeffrey, what do you think? I mean, the other argument, of course, is fine, you got a weekend or holiday coming, you get it in on the 28th or 29th day. But the ordinance doesn't say that either. And we previously have basically taken the position that if you're untimely, you're untimely. And a number of decisions over the last couple of months. But never, of course, this close. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's, we're, yeah, we're talking months yeah. or it's weeks. We're not spectrum. talking yeah. 24 well, hours. I don't think we're talking about the deadline, the 30th being on a Wednesday and they follow on a Thursday. We're, we're talking about the deadline falling on a a weekend or a holiday. On a weekend or a holiday, and then filing it the next business day. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I, I don't find as much of a problem with that, but maybe that's on this. Well, I think for this board, I mean, you, you raise a question, I think for this board, I mean, again, I'm, I'm one voice or two voices, but I think that, um, it is, it is a third, we know it's a 30 day appeal period, but I, you know, again, for clarification purposes, I would say that the 30th day, if it falls on a non business day, i.e., a holiday or a weekend, then you go to the first business day for that, for that, um, for that expiration. And I guess we need to, you know, we don't, we, we can decide it as a specific, specific to, to this application or. We can decide it as a as a as a board application. Take I, either way, I'd like the um, the vote and the motion to be such that it's at least clear enough that the to the extent it is appealed, it can be succinctly addressed by uh, the judge if it's appealed upward. Yeah, so you want a finding of fact to include the timeliness. Issue. Rather than us just saying it's timely, period. Why is it timely? I'd like an explanation why we find it timely under our ordinance. We'll put that in the record. Okay. Absolutely. But you still haven't told me what <laughs> you still haven't told me what you guys are gonna do. I'm torn. I'm torn. It's it's a good point that our ordinance does not we are aboard a limited jurisdiction and it does say it has to be within thirty days, yet in every other context, legal context that I'm aware of, if it falls on a business on a weekend or a holiday, you extend it to the next business day. But the point was made that our ordinance does not actually say that anywhere. But this is a quasi... Very true, okay. which is why I then, I'm not saying Brightline rule, no, you had to be within 30 days. So. You're Mr. Brightline. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I would say it's timely by virtue, and I would interpret our ordinance as permitting filing on the next business day if the deadline falls on a weekend or holiday. So, okay. Do we want to take a vote on that? Probably should take a vote on that. So why don't we take a vote as to what? Don't we? Yeah. Let's take a vote as to whether the the. Yeah. Want to phrase what you want? Well, we need to have a motion as to you know whether the application as submitted was submitted on a timely basis under our ordinance. I move uh, for a finding that the, that the appeal as submitted is timely by virtue of the fact that the 30th day fell on a weekend or holiday and our ordinance permits the appeal to be filed in such situations on the very next business day. That would then require a second. Okay. Any discussion or further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, so 5 0, I guess, on the time on this question. Okay, so the appeal will be heard. So is it an accessory dwelling? <laughs> so I would just note that the property card is both supports and uh, undermines their argument. We've got 1972 or 1979. It's both checked as a garage, but then it also says that the basement is used for garage and then otherwise under category dwelling then describes the construction and the replacement costs. It doesn't describe it under garage. From my perspective, it indicates in 79 this was being used as a dwelling. We then turn to the next uh, page. We have date listed, and it's either 93 or 02. It's unclear since both were marked here, but given the fact that normally these are, my understanding, filled in the first time, and this was just the revision, at least either 93 or 02, it's indicated that it's a single family seasonal occupancy. It's not categorized as a garage in whatever of these dates applies. So at that point in time, it is again being classified as seasonable, seasonal occupancy. We then, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for the uh, appellant, fortunately for the, the abutters who are opposing, have a comment in 94 saying, um, as was observed, uh, garage quarters not usable, no D system, no plumbing, not used which would indicate an abandonment of the uh, seasonal dwelling, which, from my perspective, then makes it no longer necessarily a seasonal dwelling if this was a true abandonment of that use in 1996. I may have misspoken and said 94. If you take it forward from there, everything in the record has the two properties linked the big property and the little property linked together and essentially saying you can have a residence for basically an in-law apartment type use above the garage as long as you keep it together with the big lot. And improperly, that was not recorded despite multiple kind of requests that it be so and representations that it would be so. and perhaps maybe a misunderstanding about how that was done, perhaps maybe an impression that submitting a letter to the town asking that that be done was sufficient to achieve that result. Um, and now a situation where the lots have been separated and a septic for one to two bedrooms with no garbage disposal, et cetera, is installed and permitted on this small lot and the big lot has been sold separately. And while generally I think our ordinance is to be read to encourage development of, you know, use of your own property, in the instance where there's a non-conforming use and a non-conforming lot, I think the opposite is true and that we're supposed to interpret the provisions of the ordinance strictly. And I think that what Ben's letter does in terms of laying out how that property can continue to be used, how it has been historically, 
but not expanded without zoning board approval as a non-conforming use slash lot is fair. I would agree with most of that with the exception of it being a non-conforming use because to the extent that it was used as a dwelling that is a permitted use. But nothing that we have now, everything that we have now is still showing it as an accessory because those two uses were tied together, even mm -hmm. though they're on separate lots. Right. And I think you can say that was a principal garage, maybe, um, now that they're separated, but we I don't think the town ever anticipated that they would be separated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that reading that to be an accessory um, dwelling unit is a fair read. A absolutely, and that originally bothered me, the fact that they were separated when all of the paper record indicates they were not to be separated. Um, but at the same time, I also see how uh, the former CEO would have looked at this property and said it does not fall into any of these categories clearly, because as you noted, technically it wouldn't be an accessory building by virtue of the fact that it's on a different lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I take it, uh, I agree with what's, what's been said, but I, I, also, I also put a lot of um, um, weight on kind of the character of the neighborhood character of the lot, the opinions of the neighbors, um, and this is a 4,000 square foot lot with, you know, trying to shoehorn a residence in or dwelling, and um, I'm not sure that's the intent of the ordinance or of the district, and we certainly have heard from um, many of the abutters, probably all the abutters, but certainly the majority of the neighbors. Um, that they're against characterizing this as a um, as a dwelling unit, and um, so uh, you know I'm I'm inclined to to uh, to deny the appeal. Barry, Jeffrey, I don't know how you feel about it. It really is, it hasn't been separated yet. You know the big house hasn't been sold yet. Yes, it has. It has. Yeah. So, I thought you said it had. The, the letter was. Um, put it up for sale four times. It was put up for sale multiple times. In March of this year, the CEO issued um, uh, an additional decision or interpretation as to what the, the smaller structure was. Uh, shortly thereafter, the property, the larger property, was sold to a separate owner. So they are now in different hands. Actually, it, it, and that was what my original question as to. Were the owner the the owners of the smaller lot were they aware at the time of that sale that there was previously this restriction saying you can't split them up, and they were. I'm saying what was was sold as a separate the bigger house was sold separately, correct? The title yes. passed. Yes. Title passed. Yes. You got they got a mortgage and everything. So the other house is a separate lot, but no real status because of what we're saying tonight. So they're, they're not abutting, they're... No, I know yep, yep. So it, totally separate ownership now. There was previously a restriction saying you're not allowed to split up ownership. Um, it, it's very complicated, and I would say that's not a dwelling. So, so what was that? I it's not a dwelling. I don't think that was the original intent way back, and that would be my uh, opinion. Thank you. In how would you address the... Um, town's record from either 93 or 02 characterizing it as a dwelling. Well, aren't there some aren't there later documents? I looked at it. I looked yeah, I know. Later. That's, later. That's the problem. That's the problem. I, I, That's the problem. I don't, I don't agree with the yeah. interpretation that you that you have with this building record. I think this building record, I, I see what it yeah. says there, but I see it says multiple things on this, and mm -hmm. I think that the whole thing is, it, 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 it just creates, and I think there's multiple issues in this, in this appeal, but I think that this is a non-conforming issue and I don't think that the ordinance and the intent is to continue expanding the non-conformity of a lot I think that's just not what the intent is it's not what it's designed for um, I, mean, I, I, I think there's a ton of issues but I think it's a to me it's somewhat simplistic when it comes down to the fact that I, I think it's a non-conforming Situation. I think that you just the, the ordinance is not designed to continue expanding the nonconformity of a lot. I just 
Of course, if you look at the look at the card that I'm looking at, and maybe the, maybe wait, 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 maybe there's confusion. Mine has no assessment. There's, there's no figure. It, it says not usable, no disposal system, no plumbing, not used. I know there may be a later one. Yep, yep. an the, earlier one. Yep. Or an early, well, whatever. But again, my own opinion would be what, I, what I've stated that um, it's it's not a dwelling. Yep. So irrespective of what you're going to read me. The, the, the page you're pointing at, I agree, it's, it's almost fatal to their argument because it shows that there was a break in usage as a dwelling, the, the 1996 paper, because it's their burden to show the continuous use. I'm just noting for the record that they do have an argument that in 93 and in the 1970s, one of these is 1979, it was being categorized as far back as that as being used as a dwelling. So we might want to say, no, we don't want to characterize this as a dwelling. It, it, that's not what was intended. That's not what the neighbors view it as. It doesn't fit in with the characteristics of the neighborhood. But they have a legal right to the extent that they have continuously engaged in use of this building as a dwelling going back to at least the 70s. Legally, they have a right to continue to do so that. So why are they here? But, 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 but just why, to, why, why, just why, to why, clarify yeah. that, too, aside from the abandonment, the dwelling piece was never a principal use. First, it was tied to the big house, and the principal use was the big house. And now that they're separate, I don't, I don't think you can then convert what was historically, at best, an accessory use into now being the principal use such that you can morph that structure into being a private single-family home so, from being, at best, a seasonal D dwelling so accessory would, with no toilet, no yeah. kitchen. No. So instead of characterizing it as a kind of a grandfathered standalone dwelling <clears throat> by virtue of the fact that, yes, they were not abutting, but they were um, in shared ownership, it was instead in some ways a, a grandfathered accessory building or access, accessory dwelling, even though it doesn't fit cleanly into any of the definitions in the ordinance. But, but I think to piggyback on that, you know, and I don't think this matters too much for, for me personally, but. I look at it as its primary use was, it was a garage. It was a garage then, even if they were playing pool in the top, even if someone was in a sleeping bag for a night in the top. It's been a garage. It's a garage now. It, it always, that's the one constant that it has been since it was constructed. It was a garage. Now, maybe, I mean, that's what we have. That's what we have in front of us. I and mean, that's, you know, it was, a, I mean, the, the document, the building record that you're pointing to, yeah, it says the single family, but it also says garage. And the one thing it doesn't say is abandoned as a garage. What it says is it was abandoned yep. as something where someone might have been hanging out, maybe living in seasonally. But it, it's been a garage. I mean, to me, I keep looking at all this. And I think there's, well, what's the one constant? It's, going, well, it's, it's a garage. And, but I still think, to me, at the end, it's, it really comes down to the non-conformity issues that you're touching on, and I just don't think that you, you can expand that. Uh, do we want to add um, within the conclusion the fact that it is a, um, that it's, you know, that the, that the appeals upheld as a, as a uh, or denied as a, um, that, that it's an accessory dwelling? Do we want to put that in there as a, as a conclusion? Or do we just, or do we just leave it that that the CEO's conclusion um, that the property lot 46A is an accessory dwelling is upheld? Do we think it's accurate to call it an accessory dwelling? And, but you, well, you can again. We're always simply being asked either to upheld or deny the, the appeal, and depending upon the vote. You know, the boat can speak for itself. I frankly think that accessory dwelling unit is generous. It's, yeah. I mean, that's as good as it yeah. gets. Well, well, I don't, I don't disagree with it. But I'm just wondering if we need to put any further clarification in the on the record. I think his decision asks. That's what he says, right? Right. I mean, don't. It's. I think the decision itself is fine as far as the you know. The, uh, and, and, I, and I agree with what Trina was saying. I think that the decision by the code enforcement officer is a very fair one. And I, and I do think calling it uh, an accessory dwelling is 
really about as good as it gets, quite frankly. Um, Although I don't see it as being accurate. But that I, and I agree. I'm not, I'm not even sure that's what it is. I'm not sure. It is now. I mean, yeah. now that has been transformed because of the sale of the other property. We, it has morphed into the principal building because there's no other principal building. So what else are you going to call it at this point now that the two lots are in separate ownership? You can't say it's accessory anymore because there's no other building. Yeah. Well, what about the fact, <coughs> are we viewing the prior agreement with the town that permitted the uh, revised septic system on the condition that the property stay with a uh, single ownership? Or are we accepting the representation that the CEO basically removed that restriction verbally? I think that's irrelevant. Yeah, I don't think right. I can. We don't need to go there. I, I, I just looked over his the March 29th letter. I, I think it pretty much frames the, the fact pattern and, and his decision. So I don't think we need to embellish on it. So is the current is the, the current building a now the a principal building? And if so, can we call it an accessory dwelling unit? And if not, what is it? Well, Any idea what the assessment will be as, as what it is now, a garage? Have you been issued a, a new assessment? Um, no, the property is closed. I mean, the assessor considers it a dwelling because somebody. No, no, assessment. You know, if they get. If they get given you a figure, if they've given you an assessment, maybe it's not relevant. Here's the problem. 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 Here's the the and or attached garage. So is it, can it be a single family dwelling unit within an attached garage? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, I mean, that's what this is, but. Attached garage. You would argue that the dwelling unit is above the garage that's below it. I, again, I don't, I don't know whether we really need to go there. The, the, the CEO has, has ruled that this is an accessory dwelling unit. And I don't agree with that. Okay. You know, the association should have blocked the sale. Okay. We, we, although we have nothing in the record indicating that the association had any right to enforce this restriction, instead it was a town restriction that existed. So, to the extent that the town didn't even revoke the restriction, which is the only thing we have in the record, is verbal dis uh, description of a discussion where supposedly the town revoked the restriction. The, the only other thing, that, what do you want to call it? I mean, the only thing you could call it is a principal structure. What, what is that? It's, what is that? I think that's doing. What is that? Well, the, 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 this goes to holes in the zoning ordinance. Is the problem. But I mean, what? So we've got a subordinate dwelling unit, the apartment, subordinate to the garage, and then the dwelling unit is now the principal use. So, so uh, the dwelling unit is the accessory dwelling unit, mm -hmm. and it's subordinate to the principal s structure, which is a garage. Mm -hmm. And the definition of principal building is broad enough to include a garage. It's non conforming use. But it requires, in order for it to. Um, It requires the dwelling unit to be the principal use to meet that definition. To I don't meet the definition think it of does. I don't think it does. I think oh. that's the and or language and or <laughs> attached garage in which a single. So I think they're saying that a separate. If you've got an attached garage and you've got a single family apartment in it, that's basically your, you know, the primary use of that building. You're not really using the garage anymore. Then that is also a separate accessory dwelling unit. That that's an and or separate category from this first section of the definition. It's uh, the rule of the last antecedent. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> that. <laughs> I am ashamed that I'm aware of that rule. It may not be grammatically correct, but I think that's what it's saying. The rule of the last antecedent would say that it applies to the attached garage and not to the prior um, items in the list, at least in this instance. So is there a suggested redefinition of what this is? Because if not, then uh, again, I, I think we've, we've I think we've all kind of uh, opined as to the CEO's letter. The CEO's concluded, made a conclusion. If we're going to affirm it, let's affirm it. If we're not, let's deny it. And look at what it is. Garages aren't designed to be residences. It's a, it's a non conforming use of a, isn't it a non conforming use of a garage? Because really of the what? fact that it was not in lawful existence as of the effective date of this ordinance by virtue of this statement that it was abandoned in 94. Yeah, and in that, in that, I might have misspoke before saying a non-conforming lot. I meant non-conforming use. But, it's a non-conforming I mean, lot, too. Yeah. It's only for but, I mean, I, square feet. I mean, I keep thinking of this as this is a, just it's a non-conforming use of a garage. And that's fine, they, but I'm not going to expand it. I'm not going to let them start changing the whole thing. On a non-conforming lot. Right. Okay. That's the way I see it, but I, I mean, I could be the dissenting. Are we ready to vote? <laughs> uh, I'm getting there. Did Christopher get there? <laughs> I like your non-conforming use argument. I actually think that might be the proper. No one ever likes my argument. <laughs> like all your arguments, I'm always quiet. <laughs> I think it would be, it's a princi the principal, it's a, the principal building, it's principal use as a garage. And since after 94, according to what's in the record, at some point it began being used as a dwelling unit of some sort at some point, but that would be non-conforming. It is, and I, and I agree with you, I mean, it is a non-conforming law too. I mean. Although it's, although use as a dwelling is a permitted use in the district, so I don't know if you call it a non-conforming use. The accessory dwelling unit is a non-conforming use. If you characterize it, oh, conditional uses. It's a conditional use. Under 961. What page are you on? Um, my version of the print's out, 59. It's 1961C3. That required a permit from us. What is it you're searching for? I don't think we can classify it as an accessory dwelling unit. I disagree with that interpretation from the CEO. So if, if the issue is simply, is it accurately classified, I think the answer is no. But I think we do no in a, I think we do everyone a disservice if we don't say what it is as part of this decision, because then it goes down. The CEO doesn't know how we expect him to interpret it. So he can then take a shot at the dark, shot in the dark, and then it comes back to us and we can then say, ah, oh, no, you got it wrong this time too. We also don't know what it is, but it's not this either. So ideally, I'd like for us to say what it is. So what do you think it is? That's what I'm trying to figure out, because I had, coming into this hearing, I didn't know what it was because it doesn't fit anything under our ordinance. It doesn't fit anything like, else any like better. The property assessment record, and the property assessment record calls it two things, and then one of those two things was abandoned, so then it comes back by default as to the one. So it becomes a garage, yeah, but, then, a garage. but then a accessory dwelling unit is a permitted conditional unit use if they sought a permit from us, which they didn't. 
So then I would accept it being described as an accessory dwelling unit under that argument. And I would then uphold the CEO's decision. Do you want to put the argument in as an additional finding of fact? Yes. I reached the final conclusion that I will agree with the CEO's decision that it's an accessory dwelling unit, which is a, and the reason I would reach that conclusion is viewing it as a conditional use to the garage, which that seems, is that even permitted? Potentially. But I mean, go ahead and make a, a motion if you want to, while I struggle to figure out how I would characterize this thing. Go back to this, too. The argument is that it's, that it's a condition, that the dwelling is a con that the, yeah, that the upstairs is essentially a conditional use of the garage. Which I don't think, it, but then I look at accessory dwelling unit and I understand uh, the, the argument in parsing the language, but looking at it, I think the fair reading is that the single family dwelling unit has to be the principal use for all of everything in the list at the end of the day. So I don't think it's an accessory dwelling unit. But I don't know what it is. It's primarily a garage, I'll tell you that. Maybe we just leave it at that, but I don't, this could be ping-ponging back and forth at that point. Yeah, I don't want to ping-pong till well, midnight. Well, not with us, but after we reach our conclusion. <laughs> and for all I know, the rest of you are going to say the CEO got it right, this is an accessory dwelling unit. Well, I, I take you know I, I take a, a a broader view in that again, or a way more limited view perhaps, which which is that it, if we have an appeal, which of the CEO's March 29th decision, and we've heard the evidence and we've more or less given our comments as to whether we believe the appeal should be denied or upheld, and I think that the decision, I mean, I, I think the vote can be, you know, as simple as are we, are, we, are we affirming the decision or are we denying the decision, or the appeal rather, I'm sorry. And I would like to add to that, my, in my opinion, the definition of principal building is broad enough to include this structure. The dwelling use to the extent it's his, historically existed has never been more than accessory to something and cannot, by separation of the lots, which was historically a condition of installing the septic, evolve and be magnified into making that dwelling use, the principal use, such that that non-conforming lot can then be developed with an ever more non-conforming use. And so I think that the accessory dwelling unit definition is the best fit in the ordinance. It's not perfect, but that is the nature of definitions in an ordinance where you have multiple variations on a theme within a town. And to call it something that is a conforming use such that it can t continue to be expanded upon is not a fair reading of the ordinance or of the history of this property. Okay, let's take a vote. If that passes, what can they do with that building? Continue to use it how it is now. I'm sorry, say it again? They can continue to use it how it is now. So long as it's or... subordinate to a garage. Okay, and they can't convert it to a house? It kind of already is. <laughs> well, not really. I, mean, I don't know who would buy that as a house. Okay. So there's, there's dwelling quarters and plumbing and everything else and a garage. And basically the decision that Joanna had pr proposed was the primary structure is the garage. The living structure is subordinate to the garage and above the garage and that it would be permitted at, so long as it would, it, it would be classified as an accessory dwelling unit. And because it's pre-existing, it would continue as an accessory dwelling unit. If you ever tried to turn it into the primary unit, it would no longer be an accessory dwelling unit. You will have gone beyond what was grandfathered in or previously permitted. Yeah, a gratuitous remark. The association should buy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
So does someone make a motion to concerning the appeal? I move that we deny the appeal and uphold the um, findings in the March 29, 2013 Code Enforcement Officer letter to Mrs. Dallas and Mr. Levy. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. You're, you're yep. Okay. I second and then vote against us. So, uh, four, four one uh, to deny the appeal of uh, Heather Dallas. And the one was because of the, the statement about uh, affirming all of the findings in the letter, not necessarily the conclusion. Okay, I guess I didn't really do the, okay. So um, the finding of fact uh, is the administrative appeal of map U7 lot 46A, 502 Delano Park, applicant Heather Dallas. Uh, Heather Dallas and Howard Levy are the owners of record of the property at map U U7 lot 46A at 502 Delano Park. On March 29, 2013, the code enforcement officer sent a letter to Heather Dallas and Howard Levy regarding the use of their property. Uh, on April 29, 2013, uh, Heather Dallas submitted an administrative appeal application because she does not agree with the letter from the CEO. Um, and uh, that appeal has been denied uh, four to one. Uh, an additional finding of fact is that um, the appeal was filed on a timely basis by virtue of the 30th day uh, of the uh, um, of the appeal deadline fell on a Sunday, I believe, and uh, uh, the board um, uh, the, uh, allowed it for the next business day, which is the 31st day on a Monday. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We have three more. We have to be out by 10. It'll be faster. <laughs> Much faster. <laughs> we have to be out by 10. We can start at 10 or 11. Was it 10 or 11? 11? Kevin, I'll throttle me later. <laughs> uh, let me just get organized here. It looks like we're taking a short break. Take, yeah, uh, we're going to take a, a, a short five minute break.
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would be able to Are we uh, call the meeting back uh, in adjournment? Um, next item on our uh, agenda is to hear the request of Timothy, uh, is it Gosh? Gosh, sorry. Uh, junior of 1267 Sawyer Road, map R5, lot 55. For an administrative appeal of a notice of violation and order of corrective or for corrective action dated April 9th, 2013. My name is Timothy Gosh. I'm the owner of the lot. I'll give you a little background on it. It was purchased in 1977, at which time I saw Jerry Daigle who was the code enforcement officer there, and asked him what the zoning was. It was rural farm with a business with one employee. And he said, why? I said, I own a tractor trailer. I want to park it there, build a garage at some point, and be legal with no problems. He said, no problem. I moved into the house in 78. I built the garage in 81 and 82. It, it is offset from the house. It was never meant to be a car garage. It was a garage meant to be worked on. The truck was parked there till 1991, at which time the truck left. The garage had been used to work on the truck, work on Junior's three-wheeler, my other kids' couple cars, and then once he started working at Jonesy's, he started using the garage also to work on cars, which I will let him continue. Give me pictures of the garage if you'd like to see them. Yeah, I'd like to see them. Okay. You want to see them? Yeah, give them to Okay. The, the actual, I'm not an artist or a photographer, so forgive the the thing, but the actual, the actual prints are back from the late 80s and mid 90s, and the ones that are on the paper were, were taken this afternoon. Okay. I'm thinking the date on the ATV one, we can judge it by the hair. I had a little more hair back then. The only thing that has changed, which I, regarding the letter I received from Ben, was there was a yellow inspection sign above the white side door that is not longer, I took it down once I received the letter, but do you do inspections? I do state inspections, that is correct. Are you doing that as okay. location? Yes, Kai, that is correct. Uh, can, we, can we let him sure. do it and then do your presentation? Okay. I have a working. habit of peppering people right away. <laughs> <laughs> right I have been, go I have been working on cars since roughly 1987-88. Uh, I got hired on at Jonesy's in 1988, and if people couldn't afford to have their cars fixed at Jonesy's, the boss did not mind me saying, if you want to go buy used parts and do your thing, just not on property, go ahead. Because a person can't afford to get the car fixed. And believe it or not, living in Cape Elizabeth, there's still a lot of people who, when it comes time for a state inspection, they got their fingers crossed because they got to pay the mortgage and whatnot. So I've been working in that location since 1987, 88, uh, fixing ATVs before that, and sometimes for compensation, which according to Ben, if I asked the kid to buy me a McDonald's meal, that would constitute compensation. I have even asked to, to say thank you to me, which I believe is asking for compensation. Sometimes depending on the equipment needed and the time allotment, sometimes I did because as you know, when you go hook your car up to a computer scanner, they sometimes charge you 85 to $90 because a scanner costs $5,000. For as much as I do enjoy my neighbors, I can't afford to do that stuff for free. I try to when I can, sometimes I just can't afford to. So, uh, I have been working once again for, oh, what, 20-something years, and Ben knocked on my door, said he introduced who he was, and said, do you work on cars? And I said, occasionally I do. 
He says, do you ask for compensation? I say, sometimes I do. He said, well, a complaint has been filed against you. I was taken back. I care about my neighbors, and do you guys, are you familiar with the neighborhood out that way? It's not like a Brentwood or Broad Cove. We have space. We don't talk to our neighbors when you get the mail, or even if you did talk in the mailbox, living on a 40 mile an hour road. Doesn't feel too residential when a semi truck comes by and almost knocks you off your bike. Uh, when I, all day I hear gunfire, I sometimes think, the town is calling this a residential zone, huh? Okay, I, I guess everyone has to listen to gunfire. But I was taken back because I, unlike some, I guess the earlier couple, my neighbors would come to me if there was a complaint. It's that kind of neighborhood, old school. I did have several witnesses here, but with the time, they, they had to leave. It was nice older lady, Ida McLeod, and my next door neighbor, Robert Butterfield, who lives directly across in the garage, and even said to me, I make more noise in my hobby shop than you have ever heard come from your garage. And I so I appreciate that. I had no idea they were going to come up here. I had all my neighbors, when they received that letter, all wanted to come up here. But an attorney advised me this was not the time for character witnesses. This was just a time to look at a violation and see if something had been broken. So after Ben had told me there was a file, on compl uh, a complaint filed, I said, well, who was it? I'm very concerned. Not because I was doing anything wrong. I am concerned I was upsetting the neighborhood, which if they've been good to me, and I like to think I've been good to them. He says, uh, town manager Mike McGovern knows about it. Well, I said, Ben, you mind if we take a ride up and speak to Ms. McGovern? I am concerned. Well, of course, Mike wasn't in his office. Thankfully, as I turned around, he was coming in. And I said, Mike, which I knew from working on his car at Jonesy's, I said, Mike. Not, but not at your residence. Uh, I'm sorry, what's that? Not, but not at your residence. Right, right. <laughs> right, but I did ask Mike, Mike, how many times have you drove past my house in the last three or four years? Because when Jonesy's closed, you guys remember when Jonesy's actually used to be a service station and not a $7 pizza? That was roughly the end of 07, beginning of 08. That is when I did get busier at my home location. Uh, after seeing people come to my shop, I tried not to do state inspections because I just didn't want to buy the equipment needed and I just didn't want the hassle. But after people come into my shop saying, this place wants to charge me $1,500, uh, a resident of Brentwood came back from Volvo and he says, Tim, they failed me for this crack. I needed one of those jeweler microscope to actually see the crack. So I said, this has to stop. People are literally being taken advantage of. So I did go for my inspection license and the state police, by all qualifications, the garage qualified, which I do have to admit, it's not really that hard. If you guys gave me a thousand bucks at your garage, I could make your place a state inspection station. The standards aren't like you have to be a real repair shop. You need a concrete floor and a lift. You got your state inspection license. Uh, so once I approached Mike, Mike said, actually, Tim, there was no complaint. I said, there was no complaint. He says, someone was driving by and they said they noticed a car. I go, was it a neighbor? Well, I don't think I'd call him a neighbor. He goes, Tim, it just, and I said, no, I'm really concerned. He goes, Tim, it wasn't a complaint. It came up in conversation. So I said, well, if my neighbors don't have a problem and this person doesn't have a problem, I guess we're good. And I guess Ben now has a problem. So I spoke to my neighbors and when they all saw that letter, they actually came down and said, why are they doing this to you? I'll be honest with you new court enforcement officer. I said, and they changed the zoning. They go, change the zoning? We are rural farm. Uh, Ida McLeod thought it was called agriculture. And I said, no, they changed it residential. And they said, when did they do that? And I said, I do not know, and it's very hard to get an answer. I would, I'm still would like to find out. My residents would like to, I might take that back. My neighbors would like to know. We would never notified of any zoning change. Like I said, once again, I did have a couple witnesses who would testify to that, because they all want to know, uh, they all want to know when our zoning was changed. We were not notified. So apparently on October 15, 2009, I was fine. Then, I'll, then it says, I believe in the letter, uh, I'm breaking, what, 19-3-2, which is what notifying the town on a change of use 
why would I notify the town of a change of use if I've been doing it since the mid-80s and I wasn't doing anything wrong and now all of a sudden October 15th, 2009 pops up and I'm supposed to, I guess when I started the business in the mid-80s, I was supposed to run up and tell the town in case you guys changed the zoning. I'm warning you now, so I do not see a change of use on the property. My neighbors, who would be more than happy if I'm glad they didn't come up to this meeting, because that one, whew, that was a bad one, huh? Uh, I'm just glad they didn't have to wait this long, and he, they, they wouldn't wait. I'm glad, because every neighbor who's got that letter wanted to come up and speak on my behalf. So, and, I'm sorry. Sorry to cut No, and I would just like to know, is this anyone has, did anyone officially complain about my business being there? Because I keep it very clean. Uh, cars are not left out. When you get, and that's why I said on the complaint, I don't really agree with repair shop, because I don't do any real major engine work or transmissions. Uh, I was in a motorcycle accident years ago, and so I really don't, people don't pay me top dollar, because you can't pay a mechanic top dollar with one and a half arms. So I try to help people out when I can. Uh, so there's not fluids running around, there's no 55 gallon drums of anything lying around. Uh, I know Ben did knock on my door and he did say he didn't look around. But when you walked up, Ben, did you really notice that it really looked like a repair shop other than the inspection sign as far as parts lying around or? Well, look, um, uh, let me see if I can summarize okay. a couple things. It, it, so in, in, in essence, um, since 88 or so, you've had a, you know, you've repaired some cars here informally. Subsequent to that, when Jonesy's became the pizza place. Um, <laughs> the $7 pizza. <laughs> right. You, you, um, you went and got your state inspection. Um, uh, several, not till I started after Jonesy's closed, and I didn't get the license until 2011. Okay, but, but subsequent to that, you kind of got some of the official designations of the state inspection um, location and what have you. Okay. The... Uh, You've been doing that since, again, informally since 88 or so, uh, more formally post Jonesy's close. Correct, correct. Um, somewhere between, you know, the, the, the zoning clearly changed. Uh, well, well you, you're, you're certainly now in an RA zone with a, sh with a, with a sh uh, shoreland overlay district on it. Right. Um, I mean, so that, that is what it is. Um, the only... Uh, I, I guess the only question I have would be, you know, when did the, when, you know, this, that's a question for us, is when did the, the zoning change and, um, in that area? Um, and I, can't, I don't see anything in here, but is it possible that there's some kind of grandfathering? But I guess, you know, I'm not sure that's the case. So and Just so we get those dates correct, it was you've been doing... Um, auto repair since the 80s? I myself had. He Is repaired it? trucks. So uh, on the property at that location, for how long has auto repair been going on for? Auto when did it first start? In auto repair officially probably back in, I'm going to say, 1986, dabbling. I was just learning about cars. And has it been continuous since 1986? Correct, it has been. In some the, years, some years more heavy than others, but... But always any given year there was some... Any repair. given year, that car... If I actually parked, if I actually parked cars in it, like most people drive into the garage, that would be subject to change of use. And and, <laughs> and when did you get your state inspection uh, designation? In? Two, 2011, I believe. And before the auto work, yep. there was a, a semi there did, that was having work done on it. Actually, show her the picture of the semi truck. I see the pictures, oh, okay. but I'm wondering what the dates were for that work. I believe that truck was. Uh, Is there one in the building? 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 Let me get you one. No, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Not very close. Do we, can we pepper with questions then? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you were in pepper mode. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the, the issue is that, um, and I think you don't dispute that, maybe actually you did dispute it. Um, <laughs> you're, you're doing repair work on vehicles, but you wouldn't consider it a, um, 
the technical term as used in the ordinance. Uh, you, you wouldn't call it, it's, uh, I think it's repair garage is actually. Yeah, yeah, I just don't want it compared to like a place like where you normally, <laughs> coming to my shop is not like going to any other shop. You're known on a first name basis. It's not, you're not going to say, Timmy, I need a, a $1,500 engine job. That's not going to happen. And I understand all of your, your comments that um, you're considerate of your neighbors, you don't make a lot of noise, your neighbors don't have any issue with it, and you're unaware of any like official complaint. The, the one thing that we do need to decide here, and you have a number of arguments that might help you out here that we have to figure out here, um, is that irrespective of whether there was ever a formal complaint, you. Um, your uses on the property have to comply with the zoning ordinance. Correct. It, yeah, Correct. So, so, so that's what we got to deal with. Se so, uh, separate from official complaint, how anything came in. So. Oh no! Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. But so I'm going on the like I said. I see that. I just want to make use hasn't changed. Oh, fully understand. Yeah. Okay. It, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, it might be. I, I, in our interest of getting the thing restarted, I, I uh, forgot to neglected to ask Ben if he could give us some background on this and. Um, so, Ben, if you could just give us the background on this particular case, and I guess just speak to what the zoning was that you just told me about back in 86. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gosh gave a relatively accurate description of how the last few months have played out uh, from, from an administrative perspective, uh, except for the fact about the zoning. The, that zoning district hasn't changed. I've, Since I'm, when? I'm, I've got the 86 zoning ordinance in front of me. It's, it's the Residence A district, and it's got the permitted uses in the Residence A district, and none of which resemble auto repair. Uh, home businesses are allowed, and you know, parking, you know, parking a semi truck on, on the property as, as a home occupation would, would, would probably be allowed. But an auto repair shop uh, in the Residence A district is not permitted, and, and it's also not permitted in the Shoreland Overlay District of the Spurwink Marsh. Didn't we do a car detailing facility in the RA as a home business yes. a little while back? Yes. Do you remember that one? That might have been before. I'm going to believe it was Ray Taylor on Harrison Avenue. Yeah. Yep. And one part of the home business was you cannot let fumes and stuff. Have you ever driven past this house? I see a lot of oh. soap bubbles running down the road. <laughs> I know. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. I figure he's legal now. I didn't want. I didn't want to go there. So, in no fumes, no smell, nothing in my auto repair shop is. I I believe it constitutes. If we have to go the home business route, I do not. I do not affect two percent of the traffic. Uh, and once again, I. I know it's zoned residential now, which I still kind of don't believe in because when semi-trucks go past your house at 45 miles an hour, I'm sure that doesn't happen in Brentwood or Broad Cove. I get and that on Shore Road. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and just, just today, actually, I pulled out of my driveway, headed up Sawyer Road, realized I forgot my cell phone, so I turned around the Ron and Gun Club parking lot. When I went to turn into my driveway, there was a semi-truck coming down on me so fast with a heavy piece of heavy equipment, I was scared to turn into my driveway. And I said, man, if they want to call this residential, come, come have your kids play basketball on my street. See how long that stays residential. So, um, Is your garage, sorry. No, go ahead. Is your garage more than 20% or your garage working area? We did the math, but didn't that take in effect in August of 2009? 1999. 1999. Yeah, but we'd still, I don't know whether... We came, we did the math real quick and we came, if, do you count the basement and the upstairs? Then I think, I believe it does. If you don't count the basement, no. I think we came to that, uh, me and my, a friend of mine who's an attorney, we did some math. Um, as, a, as a practical matter, um, what's before us is an appeal of the decision, mm -hmm. another decision. Um, depending upon what we rule on the appeal, um, the applicant has other venues in which he can um, rectify the problem, right? Namely, a variance, and that's a subsequent application for a subsequent day, depending upon how we rule. So, I, I guess I, in the interest of the agenda and other things, I'd like to keep it on point relative to the appeal. 
um, evaluating the appeal on its merits. And the actual appeal is the categorization of it as a repair garage? Yeah. And which is not actually a term defined in our ordinance. Incredible. I raised this issue with the town council and the planning board and the but town what, planner. But what is clear is that, um, well, it's, do we have other questions for the applicant before we? I guess that's where I was kind of going was that without a definition of what a repair, whatever it is, do, does it or doesn't it fit into the definition of a home business? But, I guess that is kind of beside the point if we're just. It would give him an additional avenue, but it's separate right. from the issue here. So you got a lift and everything? I would call it it's a semi portable. I could reach your house. It's not attached to the floor. It costs about nine hundred. It only goes up. It lifts the car up. Though. Yes, but I don't want to get any help. Maybe it lifts up and goes through a ship and she's going to stand underneath it. No, I know it's not. I know you don't have a whole bay. It's, it's a scissor one, and only the front tire comes up maybe about this high. That was required for the state police. And you had to have a concrete floor, which I, I do have. That actually just came to law in the state of Maine not too long ago. You used to have a dirt floor, you could do inspections. Any other questions for the uh, applicant? Okay. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, any public comment? Okay. I guess seeing or hearing none, uh, we will close the uh, the public portion of the uh, of this uh, agenda item and uh, move on to board deliberations. So by virtue of the fact that repair garage is missing from our ordinance, I would say nothing can be considered a repair garage in Cape Elizabeth, period. That's my interpretation. And um, the residential uses, it's not a permitted use in the, in the district. So it's proper to say it's not a permitted use, but I uh, would say it cannot be categorized as a repair garage. Say that again. Repair garage is not actually defined in our ordinance. It's, a, it's an oversight in the ordinance that has been there for a number of years. Uh, so I would say that nothing can be classified as a, a repair garage. And by virtue, that's just, so it can't be called that, but it also can't be called any of the other permitted uses. It might be potentially a, a conditional permitted home business, but that's not the issue in front of us right now. And because no permit has ever been issued giving, permitting it as a- Isn't that a solution? Hmm? What you say? <clears throat> that's a <clears throat> that's a possible solution. Uh, I'm saying it, there, it potentially could be that, but there's no guarantee it actually meets the criteria for home business. But what can I, I can say right now is it's not a permitted use right. uh, in the in the district. So, it's, but it's also not a new use, which is what the NOV says. I mean, it's clearly a use that's been there for quite some time. What? And a what? The notice of violation oh. says that it's a new use and therefore no permit was obtained and so you have to stop doing it right now or else you're subject to fines and penalties. So that part would be... Incorrect. And that part does not seem accurate to me. And 19.3.2, is that non-conforming uses? Wait, no, I think 19, no. Uh, approvals and permits required right. for conditional. So I would not uphold the notice of violation, but would note that basically it is it is a violation, but not for the grounds in the notice of violation. Therefore, overturning the notice of violation. Can I say something? Yeah, Ben. 
Well, no, just try, try not, trying to think of how to fit it into the home business. Yeah, that's, a, well, that's, that's not a, an issue that's before a, us. That's right. not that's, I know that's you said tonight. that before, but uh, <laughs> money. Uh, ben, go ahead. No, no, no. You, you've answered it already. Yeah. I can bring it up again, but <laughs> I won't. It, it, it was a use that never received permitting. The, the 86 ordinance required it to be permitted, uh, and the current ordinance requires it to be permitted. You know, my, my use of the word new, I mean, it, 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 it's a new use in town, it, whether we call new 1986 or yesterday. I, you know, I wasn't privy to the information of when the use started. Well, okay. Well, right, and and I and I told you it didn't matter because it required a permit, and if you started it in 1986, the zoning ordinance says you you needed you needed a use permit to start a repair garage in 1986. So it it was it was a new use that never received permitting. Whether, whether, whether that happened in 1986, 1996, or last month, it was a new use that has always required permitting based on our zoning ordinance. Well, you may have another venue in which to to, to address that. I do agree with you on that. Okay. Technically, the record. We've 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 closed the. And there's the two hearing, other issues so. that want us to get to them. More. Uh, okay. So I'm I'm sorry, Chris. So back, you were making a point earlier. Joanna made the point that, oh, is this, uh, is this a grandfather? She was going down the, uh, the avenue of this is a grandfathered use potentially, but the, the CEO's comment was that even going back to the 80s, basically, this was never a, something that was a permitted use in that district. So from my perspective, it is, it's a non-permitted use, but the actual notice of violation is incorrect <coughs> in classifying it as a repair garage um, because of the fact that there's no definition for repair garage. <coughs> But it is otherwise doesn't. Although it is a repair garage <laughs> rotations. Oh, from that perspective. <laughs> that I mean, you got to call it something, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a repair it's garage. It's a garage that the applicant stated he repairs cars in. That's true, a repair true, garage. True, 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 from that perspective. But it isn't a repair garage under the definition of the ordinance by virtue. I guess what I'm struggling with in the NOV is the conclusion that it's a repair garage. Repair garages are not an allowed use. Therefore, you have to, it, what it says is additionally, the zoning ordinance does not allow a use of a repair garage on your property. You mu you're in violation of the ordinance. You are ordered to immediately discontinue operating a repair garage on your property, and failure to do to stop is, you know, subject to fines and penalties. And I guess what I'm struggling with there is that yes, repair garage is not listed on the list of permitted uses in the district, even with a conditional use. But home business is. We don't know whether it's in that category or not, and we won't for some time, perhaps. And so. There's no definition of a repair garage, so how do we then determine whether or not to uphold this notice of violation without a definition saying yes or no on whether this use is or is not allowed? It just seems like it's, a struggle to... It's clearly not allowed in that it doesn't... Right, but it's, yeah. it's not defined either. Right, but it's not allowed. But it's clearly not allowed. Not, not allowed. allowed. Yeah. But can't ZBA... But does it matter? I mean... Really, I mean, it's it's a non-permitted use in RA, and if you're doing something that's non-permitted, but how do we call this a repair garage that's not permitted if it's not defined? That's not the way the way the ordinance works. Is we look at the permitted uses, which are single-family dwelling, basically dwelling, 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 then home daycare, farm and fish market, boat repair facility, golf course, wind energy, bed and breakfast. It doesn't meet any of those. Therefore, it's not a permitted use. I hear you on that, but what it's saying is that this is a use that is not allowed, not just that it's not permitted, 
And so what that means is that it's not allowed under any permitting standard in the RA zone. And I don't know that that's accurate without a definition of repair garage, because it seems to me that perhaps it does fit within the definition of home business such that it could be an allowed use, not a permitted use, but an allowed I think we're use. On the exact, we're on the exact same page in that we, I, I would overturn this notice of violation, even though it's not a permitted use by virtue of the language in the notice of violation. What's the point of a ZBA if it can't overrule some of these things? Aren't we supposed to be like the Supreme Court? <laughs> no. No, 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 I know that. Okay, no, but you know, you know what I'm saying. You know, he's in a situation like this that you want to sort of overrule it, what, what it says. And I understand what you're saying. It lacks the definition specifically, et cetera, et cetera. But I thought a ZBA has the right to overrule something like that. Maybe we can be challenged on a, was a superior court. But we still have to follow the procedures that are laid out, and we can only address the issue that's in front of us. We can't like expand. But isn't that, what's, a, isn't that what's in front of us? But what's in front of us is just this notice of violation. It isn't a full application to find that this is a uh, permitted um, home occupation use. But hasn't he been given sort of like a cease and desist? Yeah, it's basically, it's like a cease and desist order. Um, in, what is it? I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt. We oh, can overturn oh. the decision, but we don't have any enforcement power. So we can't say, we overturn this and ask that you come back and do this other different thing. Only the CEO has that authority to enforce. Okay, but what does he do in the meanwhile? Does he continue with his business while we're trying to go on to the next level? What does the businessman do? That's a good question. Are you looking at we it like that? Well, uh, virtue of the other issues in front of us, to the extent that we're ready to vote, we should. Ironically, uh, it, saying it's that. In answer to your question, Barry, it is a non-permitted use. No, I understand that. It's okay. obvious. And, I mean, and so, it's a and area. so, and so, the letter, okay, which is in your package, says that you'll immediately discontinue operating a repair garage on your property. Well, how do we wait? How do we? Waive that. I thought ZBA had what, the power to do that. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. He's been there for I don't know about the we part. I think there are some members on the board who may not agree it should be waived. Okay, talking about myself then. You have a guy that's been there since a long, long time. You want him to sort of continue. It's not like some, um, some guy came in there and selling fireworks or something. It's not permitted. You want to help? How do we help this guy? I mean, that's where my attitude c comes and in. There are other, and there are potentially other venues available to the applicant to address that. Such as? But it's not, it's not through this specific application that's before us tonight. But he can continue in business in the meanwhile. In spite of the fact he got that, uh, that letter. Not necessarily. Yeah. What? Not necessarily. I know you're not his attorney, but what does he do? <laughs> it's not before us. Yeah. I know, but we're having a conversation. No, we're really not it's having private. a conversation. Ideally, I'd like to get the vote done so we can get the last, at least one of the other ones before 10, because otherwise. Right. Before 11. Go ahead. Oh, is it 11? Well, he said you have to begin by 10. Yeah. yeah. All right. But be that as me, I'll, I'll back up, but I'm just thinking of a way to help him. Okay. Which is understandable. Yeah. All we all, we all, no, all of us want to do that. It's just. The, I don't worry. It'll be just, okay. It's just the venue in, in which it has to be done. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, so I, I, I guess where, it, I, I guess where we left off is, that, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth. Is there's not a disagreement that it's certainly not a permitted use in the RA Shoreland Overland District. It's not. Okay. Yep. And wh where I'm hearing some having agita is around it, this being designated as a repair garage, which, okay, is not a defined term, but the broader concern is, therefore, he shouldn't be subject to uh, discontinuing the use immediately? My concern is broader than that. It's that the NOV issued based on the repair garage not being on the list of uses that's permissible in the district. But there are other things on that list that may include what he's doing that are permissible in the district. And so I guess what I don't know is whether when that's the case, <coughs> the town issues an NOV for something that is permissible, say for example, as a home business, 
or if the reason why it went to this level, which I haven't seen before, is because it was something that was not on the list at all. And so what I'm struggling with is it being categorized as something that's not on the list at all when that something that's not on the list at all is not defined, if that makes any sense. So how do you say what it is if there's no definition for it? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm sorry. It's a little, I'm kind of. <laughs> it's not permitted, but we don't want to uphold the finding that it is a repair garage. Then why don't we just say it's a non-permitted use of a, of, a, of a business entity? Which is basically upholding most of the findings of fact, at least as listed here. Do we issue NOVs to folks that are operating things that may be permissible, or would we, or would we say, hey, come in and put in an application? Well, it is a violation because there has been no application, so I mean, it would be. Well, right, but I'm just wondering what we do. For, for the sake of time, if, if, we, if we don't want to go there, you, we, you can strike that from the violation letter, not have it as a finding, and just say you're, you're in violation because you didn't get a permit for your use. You have to get a permit. And yes. then, which we and, may or may not and, issue. And then, yeah. and then we take it from there. Yes, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that'll work. Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. So, are we ready to vote? Okay. So, I want to make a motion. Okay. Okay. We can't move on until someone makes a motion. <laughs> I am moving that we partially deny and uphold the appeal in that we're striking language from the NOV and revising it to specify that a permit is required for the use. To the extent it's permitted. Correct. Uh, uh, no, I, I know. <laughs> I, I just, I'm, not, I'm just like thinking it through. I'm not saying, gee, that's a bad motion. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. I am striking sentence. I'm proposing that we strike sentence. The last three sentences of paragraph one of the NOV. Starting at this activity constitutes and running through the end of that paragraph. You're on the first, end of the first paragraph? Correct. Starting at this activity constitutes a new use on the property, deleting that through, additionally, the zoning ordinance does not allow a use of repair garage on your property. You're leaving that. No, I'm deleting that. So this activity down to the end of the paragraph. Mm-hmm. And then in the second paragraph, revising the first sentence to say, are hereby ordered to immediately discontinue operating a non-permitted use. Yeah. A non-permitted use business entity. on your property. Yep. So just going back up to the first paragraph, um, you stated that you occasionally repair vehicles in the, uh, in the garage and accept compensation for your services. Period, that's the end of the paragraph. Yeah, understood. And then where are you picking up the sentence? And you, are, and you have not obtained this approval? So that's not a sentence. I know, just delete all of that paragraph from there on. Simply, the paragraph ends with, you stated that you occasionally repair vehicles in the garage and accept compensation for your services, period. End of paragraph. New paragraph, you're in violation, blah, 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 in order to immediately discontinue operating a non-permitted use business, business entity on your property. Okay. 
Okay. So we're doing a partial upholding the code enforcement officer's uh, notice of violation as revised by the board. I accept that motion, that amendment to my, that friendly amendment <laughs> to my motion. Do we have a second? <laughs> second. Okay. So the vote is to uphold, or no, it's to, yeah, it, it's essentially to deny the appeal. You're denying the appeal. Okay, but revising the NOV um, as, as revised by the board. Okay, and do we, okay, and we'll su just submit the letter into the record as the revision. Okay. Okay, so all in favor of denying, denying the appeal. Any opposed? Okay, so the appeal is denied 5 0. Uh, and the revised notice of uh, violation will be entered into the, to the record. Um, so you can re resubmit it. Okay. So um, let me just. Do the administer uh, the finding of facts. Administrative appeal for uh, twelve sixty seven Sawyer Road, Map R five, lot fifty five. Applicant <laughs> Timothy Gosh. Correct. Finally got it right. Okay. Timothy Gosh Jr. is the owner of record of the property at twelve sixty seven Sawyer Road, Map R five, lot fifty five. On April 9, two thousand thirteen, the code enforcement officer sent a notice of violation and order for corrective action to Mr. Gosh regarding the use of his property. On May 6, 2013, Mr. Gosh submitted an administrative appeal application because he does not believe the auto repair is a correct, a correct description for the use of his property. Uh, and the board has voted to deny the appeal 5-0 um, with a revision to the notice of violation um, as uh, approved here tonight by the board. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Timothy. You're welcome. Moving on to our third agenda item. Now, I guess I guess before we. Uh, uh, just as a, as a point of procedure is 10 o'clock the, the last item we can take? Correct. No, sorry. All right. In, just for completeness, <laughs> the two findings of facts that, that we've made for both this uh, decision and the prior one, we technically didn't take a vote adopting those findings of fact. You want to just right now? I, I don't think they were disputed, but formally do we... Do we see a need to just do a 5-0 vote on both those issues? Uh, can we do it after the next one? Fine with me. Yeah, just because I want to get I want to yep. start this before yep. 10, so we're... Yep. Totally agree. Okay. This is a, this is a preliminary uh, this next one. Yeah. I'll find my agenda. What's next? Levesque variance. Yeah, Levesque variance. Um, just as a uh, a point of reference, I, I don't think we're going to get to item four this evening. I'm sorry. I tried. We're not. It's not happen. It's. Yeah, we're not. It, you may leave. It is not going to happen. <laughs> It, it was I'm worth sorry. a shot, but <laughs> technically we have the ability to extend it, but it sounds like a majority of the board is not. I would say that we'll see you next month, <laughs> is what I would say. Sorry. We tried. I tried. We tried. Okay. Um, item three is to hear the request of William Royal, represented 
representing uh, Anthony and Donna Levesque of 11 Vernon Road, map U19, lot 7-35 for a variance to construct a garage. Let me, let, me, let me just say for the record, just in case anyone has a problem with it, Bill's daughter was on my outstanding softball team. I'm glad I got there that on the record. I want them all to make sure that they watch this on videotape and they all realize I put that in there. It has no effect in any way, shape, or form on my ability to be impartial. In fact, Bill can probably tell you I, don't, I know nothing at all about this, and he certainly has never talked to me about it. But if anyone on the on the board has a problem with it, I'm certainly happy to recuse myself. So she's just a, a casual social acquaintance. Yes, just a, yes. Sorry, you have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with that, Mr. Royal, take it away. Okay, well, I'm here today to ask for a 10-foot variance to the side yard setback, so to allow Tony and Donna to build a garage on their property to enclose a wheelchair ramp so that he can get in the house without being subjected to the elements. Uh, they've lived on the property since the late 60s when they first bought the house. They had the option of putting a two-car garage on, which at the time was financially impossible. And since then, the zoning has changed to not allow that. And we'd like to get that fixed. Um, I, I think I uh, figured this out after I looked through the package. But uh, the ramp is, uh, you're going to cover the ramp. I know that. But so the ramp's staying in the same location? No. That's the ramp's going to be removed. And it's going to be oh. in the back of the garage. Oh, I see. OK. So the, the ramp is going to be uh, inside of the garage at the back? Inside the garage, in the back. And just as a comment, thank you for submitting the photos of the uh, other properties with garages into the record. <laughs> and very well. There's 15 houses in the development. 13 of them have garages. And for me, that's a key point. So the surrounding neighborhoods, there's only two of the 15 that are lacking a garage. And Correct. as you noted in the photos, most of them are Including them. They're one of the 15. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the two that don't. So, uh, and the photos indicate that the sizes of the garages in the surrounding neighborhood are approximately equivalent to what you're looking to. Yes. And how many of, do you know how many of those garages are, are within the, or beyond the setback, if you will? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't, but driving through the neighborhood, they're certainly much closer than 25 feet. They all came with the houses at the time we bought that house. We are still one or two. Okay. So that, yeah, that's the one wrinkle of that that's missing is, are the other ones as close to the setback? If you look at the, um, the notice of public hearing, it does show kind of the general, there's no dimensions that are on there, but you can see the location of the houses. You can kind of tell what is the garage and what isn't and where it is on the lot. <coughs> It does look like a lot of them have to be pretty close to the lot line. They are. If not over it. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the one next door. <laughs> Jesus. Surprised that one hasn't well, come before it yet. Is the garage going to um, block any of any views, or is it going to cast any shadow no. on the other? No. And I actually have a letter from the abutting neighbor that it's going to be closest to. Okay. If you'd like to hear that? Do you want to submit that for the, I for the record? Certainly. Yeah. 
We always like to hear from the you know neighbors on things like this. Thank you. And uh, where are the well uh, the Wellmans on? Uh, they're at five they're at number five. five. They're they're the next door neighbor. So the gr the garage that we'd like to construct will be the setback will be granted towards there. Okay, so the well is to your, to your, if you're facing the house to the right. To the right, yes. Okay. how big these lots are, what the um, road frontage dimension is? Uh, I believe it's 100 feet, 110 feet. It's on... It's a hunt, yeah. It's 100 across the front, 110 to the back. Have any of uh, your other neighbors uh, opposed it or uh, said anything one way or the other? No, I told, you know, let them know that we would be thinking about doing it. And nobody had any opposition. I want to throw one thing in, and I can't on the ground. Can you come to the microphone just so we can hear you? You said that you'd like to hear from the neighbors. Well, either in would, writing or verbally. Would what? you like to hear from the person that lives in the situation? Sure. Okay, that's me. You're the applicant. I am the yeah. one. This past winter when we had that terrible storm in, was it March? January. We, uh, I thought it was March, but maybe it was February. Um, I felt that myself and my husband were both in an unsafe situation because we physically could not open the doors mm. to our house. The snow was up against the back door, which is fine. You can't get down there anyway because there's two um, steps. But the ramp door, the door in the front that goes out to the ramp, it was up to the um, doorknob. So I could open the door about this way much and say, I can't get out of the house. And I couldn't get him out, and I just felt we were both in an unsafe situation because the ramp is on the outside of the house. That's why I'm saying, please, let us get it inside of a garage. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, I didn't receive any comments regarding the application after the public notice was sent. Okay. Thank you, Ben. And would, this, would the notice have gone to all the houses that are shown on this map? Yes. Uh, I notice there's a shed there now. Uh, the shed will is it going away. Okay. It just says on the drawing to be moved, so I didn't know if you were moving it. It's somewhere. actually going to be pushed back. Okay, so it's staying. It's just going behind the garage. Yeah. There's no foundation. It's on blocks. And what would be the height of the garage? Uh... I don't have the elevation drawing with me, but seventeen feet maybe. Have the have the plans been submitted to I haven't gone for the application for permit okay. yet. Okay. So But it's gonna be roughly a single story. It's a single story garage. Maybe. No one's gonna live in it. Have, have you and decided what the roof pitch is gonna be? A five to match the house. Okay, that's a very shallow pitch, single okay. story. So it will basically just go over from the... It will basically look like the other garages in the pictures. It's 13 feet. Yeah. I think we'll just, we'll just add the, either the 
plans are submitted for approval or the height restriction is part of the, the, um, the conclusions or finding of facts. There's no sketch of the design, what it will look like at the end? Yes, I have one right here. Is it in our package here? It's not in your package. I'm sorry. It wasn't sorry, ready at the time that I submitted the package. Well, let me take a look at it. Sure. Imagine what it's going to look like. <laughs> not that we're a, a architecture review board, but thank you. Just go ahead. What is this? this, this what are these? That's Show, that part, the, the house shingles. Oh, that's the, oh yeah, it's going into the house? No, this, this would be the new garage area. Right. And then part of this is to construct the ramp across the back, which meant I had to extend the roof of the house back to encompass the ramp. So that's what you see here. If I'm see. looking at the house, what do I see? Do the I see house, the existing structure is this. Yeah, and this is the addition, of course. And this is the addition. Only single car? Oh, it's a two-car garage, but it's single. Door. It's a single door. That's what wide enough. Excuse it has me. to be right. It's the measurements, anyways. Huh? Oh, we got them here. That's a floor plan. So this is all existing. But I'm interested in the exterior. What it will look like. Uh, it's all going to be. See, when he drew this, he shaded the existing house. Are oh, you an architect? Am I? No, no. Who, who drew this? An oh, architect? Peter Polanza. And what is he? He's a draftsman. His father actually built a house. He's a local he's a designer. He's not an architect, but he's a local designer. I thank you. Okay. Um, Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. I don't see I don't see anybody else uh, <coughs> sitting here to for public comment. So, uh, hear, hearing or seeing no public comment, we'll close the public comment portion of the the hearing and. Uh, move on to the board deliberations. I would just make the observation that in addition to just the regular uh, criteria that need to be evaluated for a variance, there is the additional uh, lesser uh, finding that is needed in the instances where the building is being made accessible to a person with a disability, which would also potentially apply here. And to the extent that the there is currently access by way of a ramp, but it's an outside ramp that causes problems in the wintertime, I do understand. I would say that making a covered interior area, which I would say this is pretty close to meeting with an interior ramp, would fall under that criteria as well. And where is that, Chris, that you're, uh, you're looking 1952 Powers and Duties, subsection B, variances, uh, the very last paragraph under section one, all districts except the Shoreland Performance Overlay District notes that the, zoning, the ZBA may grant a variance for the purpose of making a property accessible to an applicant with a disability who is living on the property without a finding that a strict application of the ordinance to the applicant and the applicant's property would cause practical difficulty. I should just ask, I should just ask you for the page number. Oh, 51 in my version. Thank you. God, that was much simpler. I think we should nevertheless step through the practical difficulty criteria, but keeping in mind that there's the additional basis for granting the But it's an additional consideration. Request. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Um, Yeah, I, I think the, uh, I mean, it's clear that from a characteristic perspective, I think that, you know, them being one of only two other homes that doesn't have a garage is pretty much indicative of the, the character. Um, I would have liked to have seen something a little more definitive than us eyeballing the, uh, the notice of public hearing and saying, yeah, it looks like it's pretty close to the setback line or 
on the sides. But, but um, absent that, I think that, um, you know, and, and actually just looking at some of these pictures, they appear, some of these appear to be pretty close to the, to the side setbacks as it is anyway. Um, you know, we have at least, you know, an abutting neighbor uh, supporting the, the garage. And according to Ben and not seeing anyone here, no one opposed to it. Um, so, again, just I, I guess from my perspective, I'm, I'm supportive of the, of the variance. Of, it, of course, your, all of your thoughts and comments. So. I support granting it. Um, also noting the fact that we don't have explicitly what the uh, setbacks are on the adjacent properties, but the pictures, when factoring in the fact that there's potentially the additional criteria for granting uh, the variance in order to co provide covered access, I think we could say it's safely met here. I agree, looking at the, the four criteria that, um, sorry, five criteria that each of them are met, you know, that um, there certainly will not appear to be an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. It will actually make it much more consistent with the other homes in the neighborhood. Um, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken and there um, is not, you can't make the non-conforming lot size any bigger, so. Okay, um, are we ready to vote on this? Okay, as usual, someone other than me will have to make a motion. I move we approve the variance request for map U 19, lot 7 35 at 11 Vernon Road for applicants William Royal on behalf of Anthony and Donna Levesque. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so that's 5 0. Okay, so why don't we go through the additional finding fa of facts? Um, um, and we'll actually vote on this time. Vote on Just read them all in. Yeah, we'll just. Yeah, right. Uh, variance request for. Finding effect, uh, variance request for map U19, lot 7-35, 11 Vernon Road. Applicant William Royal on behalf of Anthony and Donna Levesque. Uh, Anthony and Donna Levesque are owners of map, of record of map U19, lot 7-35, 11 Vernon Road. 11 Vernon Road is a non-conforming lot in the RA district. The required setback are 25 feet on the front, 25 feet on the side, and 20 feet on the rear. In order to construct an attached two-car garage, the applicant is requesting a variance that allows a side setback of 15 feet on the easterly side of the property. There is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and a literal enforcement of the ordinance shall cause a practical difficulty as defined by MRSA section 43534-C. Um, and the only additional part would be it, we're not just outright granting a side setback of 15 feet, it's a side setback of 15 feet to build the proposed structure. You know what I mean? Uh, so they can't build a mansion of whatever size. Right, but doesn't in order to construct a two car. Oh, sorry. Totally. It's okay. Just we're just check. Um, I, I, I we also talked though about um, as uh, a, of, of adding a height restriction, uh, and I don't know what the so I, I guess the height the height restriction would be um, an attached one story two car garage. So just to revise the existing three to say in order to construct an attached one story two car garage. Yep, we can do that, yep. Okay, so number three of the finding of facts would be in order to construct an attached one-story 
two-car garage, the applicant is requesting a variance that allows a side setback of 15 feet on the easterly side of the property. Okay. Um, all in favor of those uh, additional finding effects? Any opposed? Okay, so that's five yes, zero no. Okay, um, that takes care of this application. Thank you, congratulations. Uh, why don't we go back to the addition? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, why don't we go back to the uh, just vote on the? Uh, I think we just say uh, for the first one. Um, we previously covered the finding facts. All in favor, uh, as read. Of, of the um, on the appeal. For for um, both of the first two issues. So the, the, hot, the hotly contested issue, there were findings of fact. We, we voted on a conclusion, then there were findings of fact, but we technically didn't take a vote on the findings of fact. I, right. Well, I, I agree. So do we want to reread these and just vote on them? Or I guess want to say that we're, we're voting 5-0 for the additional finding of facts of the administrative appeal for Timothy Ghosh. Why don't we just say, like, to clarify the record, we're, we're now voting in favor of our findings of fact consistent with the decisions that we did earlier tonight. Does that work? Yeah, that works. Okay. So we're just taking, uh, we're just doing an additional finding of facts, or we're just affirming a finding of facts for uh, the administrative appeal of uh, um, for, uh that we voted on previously uh, for 1260, for Timothy Gosh, Jr. at 1267 Sawyer Road, uh, map R5, lot 55. Uh, and I, uh, are we actually, we're gonna vote on those? Yeah. Yeah. So, so all in favor of the finding of facts? Any opposed? So that's 5-0. The same with the Delano Park one. And Delano Park. Um, Dallas Levy. I'm not even sure I, I must have seen an additional finding effect in there somewhere. Camera still on? Yep, yeah. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so again, we're, we're affirming the previously reviewed uh, additional finding of facts um, in the uh, Administrative appeal for map U7, lot 46A, 502 Delano Park, uh, the application of uh, Heather Dallas. Uh, all voting in favor of the finding of facts. Any opposed? That's 5 0. Yes, 0 no. And with that, uh, not, there not being any other business, uh, the application um, for Kelly's that was fourth on the agenda will be heard next month. And uh, with that, we'll uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Do we have anything else for July yet? Or? I, you better say no. <laughs> <laughs>